What's up, Captains? I'm so glad you're tuning into this week's episode of the Captain's Lifestyle Podcast because I'm interviewing somebody who I've wanted to have on the show for years now. After hearing him on Ben Greenfield's podcast a while back, talking about the effects of light on our health, happiness, and productivity, specifically as it relates to our circadian rhythm and sleep. But in this interview, I didn't really ask him much about light, even though he's an expert in that field. We saved that to the very end because I wanted to talk about something that's a lot more important than diet, exercise, light exposure, all of that. Everything that I've talked about on this podcast before is not as important as what we talk about in today's episode. So I believe that this week's episode has the potential to be the most impactful episode that for sure ever released to date and potentially ever. And I say potentially because that's up to you. And we, we get into this a little bit on the show. Please don't just hear this episode actually listen to it and understand and, and really start to comprehend what Matt is, is talking about and, and trying to drive home in this interview. So this is not an episode that I recommend you are multitasking. I recommend that you are able to be in a quiet place with no other distractions, be able to, to take notes and be attentive. It's a long episode, so bear with us uh, if you can listen to it on one and a half speed or two times speed. If you can still comprehend what we're saying at that speed, but it's well worth a listen. Like I said, I believe that this is the most important episode that I've ever recorded. And I really hope that people listen to it and not just hear it, but actually listen to it. Like I mentioned, and it, this might go over the, the tops of your heads for a lot of people. Uh, I know it would have went well over the top of my head, even a year ago, but that still doesn't mean that we can't plant the seed now. And a lot of these things that we mentioned in this episode are hard pills to swallow, right? They, they take time. They're not these easy, quick switches. And it might take a few times of, of hearing this, but just know that once you do truly understand these concepts, it's like a weight is lifted off of your shoulders and life just gets a whole lot easier and you just get a whole lot happier. So, uh, that's kind of like a disclaimer for today's episode. We do talk about um, the, the effects of light at the end of the show. Um, and that brings me to Matt's company. So I'm interviewing Matt Maruka, who is the founder of Raw Optics, this blue light blocking glasses company. And I love Raw Optics because they are some of the most effective blue light blocking glasses out there. A lot of those clear lenses that you may see Instagram ads for, those are all bullshit. They don't work. As Matt talks about in this episode, in order to block the blue wavelength of light, they have to be either yellow tinted or orangish, amber, red tinted. So these lenses that I have on right now are their sleep lenses, which block 100% of blue light. They also make uh, daytime screen lenses to use if you are working in an office, sitting under fluorescent lights, staring at a computer screen all day. Those are very good for headaches, eye strain, things like that. Um, and what I really like is this little saying I think it's reversed in the video that they put on their glasses case. I'll read it out to you guys. In order to elevate humanity, we must each elevate ourselves. And that's something that we talk about in today's episode. You can't pour from an empty cup. So you have to start dialing yourself in first before you can truly give to everybody else around you. And so to, to get the hookup on raw optics, what I would recommend is actually to buy a pair of their daytime lenses and a pair of their nighttime lenses. Because when you buy two pairs, you get the light diet course for free. And this is something we talk about on the show. It's basically Matt's eight pillars of how to live a healthy, optimized lifestyle. And you get that for free. It's normally, I believe, uh, 115. But buy two pairs of glasses. Again, get the daytime lenses, the nighttime lenses, Plus, you get a discount using my code, Captain Morgan. Just click the link in the show notes. It will take you directly there. And then you get access to the light diet course for free. I don't know about a much better deal than this. You get to protect your eyes during the day if you're in an office building and you get to protect your sleep at night, which as you know, when you uh, improve the quality of your sleep, a rising tide raises all ships. Sleep is that rising tide. Once you start to improve the quality of your sleep by getting healthy light exposure in the morning and throughout the day, and then blocking artificial blue light in the evening, <laughs> life gets a whole lot better. So you get to do that plus access to the light diet course for free. It's a no brainer. So again, use code Captain Morgan. Click the link in the show notes of this podcast to take you directly there. And by doing that, 
not only does that help me because I get a percentage of those sales. So that helps me to continue bringing you this podcast for free every single week, but it also helps Matt continue to do this research. So if you guys resonate with what we're talking about in today's episode, please, please, please support Matt and Raw Optics by using the discount link in the show notes of this podcast. All right. With all that being said, let's dive into today's interview with Matt Maruka. Matt, welcome to the show. Aye, aye, Captain. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> Sweet. Well, before we dive into what we were talking about, I think it's helpful for people to have a little bit of a background on you and what led you down this journey. So I mentioned in the intro those those chronic problems that you were experiencing as a teenager. Talk to us a little bit about what was going on there. Yeah, so I'll start with the real underpinning of everything. And I realized this recently as I started to reshape my story. One of the things I've learned in my experiences and especially going on a super deep dive into the world of sort of scientific spirituality over the last year is that a lot of the time when we retell stories, especially of what we call the past, we're actually just reconstructing and attempting to re-solidify to become comfortable with the person who we think we are, you know, to, to reconstruct that reality because we know it and that's who we think we are. And we're comfortable within that known set of circumstances and ideas. And so I started to ask myself, well, wait a minute, I go on all these podcasts and I write all these articles or, you know, blogs or emails. And a lot of the time I lead with the same story that was what basically got me sick in the first place that I was so attached to. And I thought, is there a way that I could tell the story differently with, you know, not embellishing anything, just because when we tell the past, there's actually evidence that often, more often than not, the majority of the details are actually made up or heavily embellished. So I thought, and, and a friend of mine actually recently, I was, I was with a couple of buddies, one who's really big up in the music industry and, you know, produced a lot of really big uh, musicians and so on over the last 30, 40 years. And they were talking about this movie that recently came, came out about Bob Dylan. And it was the second movie about Bob Dylan that's come out. And this one, the director, I, I believe the screenwriter as well, he actually intentionally embellished most of the movie. It was mostly made up. And he asked Dylan before he passed, like, is it cool if we do this? Mm. And he said, yeah, of course. In other words, and people love the movie and some people were triggered and some critics were triggered that like, this isn't even real, but other people are like, no, that's what he wanted. Like Bob Dylan, the man and what happened is one, one thing, right? The myth, the legend, the whole thing is much bigger than just one human being who lived, you know, the culture, the energy, the music, like it's so far beyond the human being, Bob Dylan, just like the story of Jesus Christ, for example, you know? which is a story I'm very, very fond of personally. And so I thought, what if I could like go back and just selectively retell my past story in a way that was more conducive to my own happiness rather than just reinforcing the person I think I, I was. And I, the reason I share this is because I think it could be really useful for everyone to go back and be like, wait a minute, what are the stories I'm telling about who I think I am and who I think I'm supposed to be that I could just decide that, you know, I'm going to let go of just in the same way that, you know, you're in playing poker, for example, best example I've thought of so far. And I think they call it the sunk cost fallacy. You know, you're deep in on a hand and you know, you know, you're out, you know, you're not going to make it. Somebody's got a better hand. You're sure of it. The odds are just totally against you, but you're just like, oh, but I have so much money in the pot. I might as well try. You know, I don't even have like, you don't even have a pair. You really were just bluffing or, or you maybe have a pair, but you know, someone has three of a kind or whatever. So, you know, I'm encouraging myself as well as anyone else to say like, just because I have so much money in the pot doesn't mean you can't start over and, and kind of cut your losses at this point. So the story that I decided to sort of uh, start trying to retell in my case was really looking again at, at something that's true, which is when I was younger, I had a, an idea that humans had the potential to be great. You know, the people had the potential to be great, that, that I could be great, you know, and, and I, I was inspired, for example, by people like Nelson Mandela, 
Steve Jobs and other in people who I saw even at the age of six, seven, eight years old to be really significant people who really changed the world. You know, I read Nelson Mandela's book. I remember watching Steve Jobs like launch the iPhone and I thought, wow, this is amazing. This is really cool. And one thing that was interesting, I learned from a, a yogi friend of mine who I will cite probably several times throughout this interview that and this is a yogi, not like someone living in, in a mountain in a cave, but actually, and not just someone who does postures either. That's, a, that's not necessarily what yoga actually is. Those are asanas, postures, or hatha yoga is a type of using the body to improve health and oneness and so on. But that's, that's not necessarily just all yogis do yoga in that sense. Anyway, so this guy is actually a modern day kind of yogi who's in an ancient lineage with a master and training in these practices of meditation, breath work, and physical hatha yoga postures, asanas. Anyway, he told me that when you read something that's true, he said, you, you know why it feels so good? He said, I said, no, he said, because your soul already knows everything. So it's just reminding you it's, it's a resonance with something your soul already knows. And that's why it feels so familiar and so good. And so I think that somehow my soul already knew this. And when I would see people so successful and, and inspiring, I was sure that I was meant to do something like this myself. It just was without a doubt, you know, and even watching movies that they say are made up like Harry Potter or Star Wars or, you know, any, any movies like this Lord of the Rings, where there's a sort of hero's journey. It's like those movies, I, I started to learn those aren't fiction movies. I mean, we, we say they're fiction, but they're actually the truth of the emotional experiences that someone goes through on the hero's journey. I found this fascinating. So this was what was inspiring me. And then as time went on, and I think I became a little bit more schooled, I'll just put it that way, like I was in, you know, schooled, basically, yeah. I became, I think I lost a sense of that sort of inspiration for, if I had to guess, probably like after age, when my, when my uh, memory, as I consider it, my memory begins, you know, probably age 10 or 11, which is kind of when that super youthful energy maybe was being chipped away, fourth grade, fifth grade, you know, it was really kind of fading out. I remember a lot more struggling going on um, in, in general. I still had fun with my buddies, but I remember having these serious uh, pollen allergies, gut issues, headaches, and all these things. And not sure whether I really recalled that dream that was sort of inspiring me, but as time went on, by the time I became a freshman in high school, about age 14, my symptoms were strong enough that I was super driven to start researching into health and start looking into like, well, I've already gone to Western doctors. My mom took me to Western doctors, gastro doctors, allergists, primary care, regular physicians for headaches, you know, gastro doctor for gut issues, allergists, of course, for allergy symptoms. And none of them worked. They just gave pills. I didn't know anything about why that would or wouldn't work at the time. I even saw a naturopath, which I have way more uh, belief in naturopathy than I do in Western medicine, but it still didn't work. So by 13, I was trying different diets. I got into the paleo diet because I Google searched how to heal a damaged gut because I was having such bad gut pain, gas and bloating that how to heal a damaged gut led to, which was just my kind of um, my gut must be damaged idea. At, you know, what do you know at age 14 really about this stuff? I didn't know anything, but the paleo diet particularly inspired me when I read the concept, the word epigenetics on Mark Sisson's blog in 2014, approximately. And I had, there's no way I could have ever heard of the word epigenetics before that. It wasn't even like scientifically a concept in the journals, which are like, you know, ages. I mean, maybe it was a general concept, but it, it wasn't something I would have heard. Right. But Mark Sisson, this paleo blogger is talking about how epigenetics is the science of how you can turn on and off certain genes using environmental factors of which he claimed at the time were 80% food and the rest 20% exercise, lifestyle, everything else. Hmm. So I became obsessed, like desperate, obsessed. Like you give a drug addict a drug. I was addicted to the idea that food would heal me. So I went all in. And when I got like a 50% result, it was like, oh, this has, this is for sure the answer. hundred, it couldn't not be. So I went like deeper, deeper, deeper. And because I was only 50, 60% feeling, you know, better, which was amazing for me. Like my allergies, headaches, gut issues, as far as I was concerned, almost went away. It seemed like in a week or two from cutting so much junk food out of my diet, but I would still be fatigued. I'd still have sort of 
weird, different symptoms like headaches here and there just didn't feel myself. And I knew for sure. Now I was re-inspired of my childhood vision. I was sure that we could, we could be really great. I'm, I was sure we could be like superhuman, you know, especially looking at, wow, I was so bought in on the propaganda, like this diet, it's killing everyone. And if we ate like our ancestors, we could be like gods. And I was sure this, this was the truth, just as I'm sure of things I believe now, you know? Um, but you know, now I'm actually a lot more skeptical, I would say, to be honest. So anyway, So that actually isn't true. I'm much more skeptical now of what I believe. Then I thought I knew it all. So step by step by step, I went stricter and stricter on these diet protocols because I didn't, I I thought there was more and I didn't think, I didn't feel like I was whole. I didn't feel it yet. Right. So it's stricter, stricter, stricter. And interestingly, all the while, I was actually going further and further from wholeness. Like I started getting sicker and sicker and sicker. The more I identified as a sick person who needed to be healed, the sicker I actually got, the worse my symptoms started to get after an initial benefit. And I went on to even stricter diets. And eventually I started binge dieting and yo-yo dieting because on these diets, they teach that if you have even a blueberry that activates your immune system, like the autoimmune protocol, you you're done and you have to start over. Like it'll basically like, it'll kill you, you know, um, as if the immune system doesn't know better than that, you know, but anyway, or at least that a healthy immune system wouldn't know better than that. But anyhow, no one was telling me these things. So eventually after a extreme, I won't get into that because I don't want to retell that story too much, but like it was an extreme period of challenge with uh, obsessive dieting, where I, I reinforced to the nth degree, the idea that I was worthless, that I couldn't control myself, that all of my suffering was my fault. And I was choosing to be miserable. And I could, you know, and then I came across this really interesting research. It was this idea someone was posting, basically saying, is the paleo diet not working to heal you or food diets not working to heal you? Maybe it's because it isn't all about food. Maybe it's because your mitochondria, your cellular engines aren't working well and they aren't fully controlled by food. They're actually affected more by light. And I was like a fish with a big hook in my mouth. I was like, (laughs) Oh, I'm going down this rabbit hole. So I went way down that rabbit hole and it was really interesting and way deeper than food for sure. Like I was reading all these amazing books about energy, about light, about biophotons, about electromagnetism in our cells and stuff that truly was much deeper. And the people I was learning from, the people I was following were basically tying this together in such a way as to say, here's the things you need to do about light, you know, to optimize your light environment. You need to watch the sunrise, watch the sunset, go out and sunbathe. You need to get in cold water. You need to eat more seafood because it has this omega-3 DHA that's super beneficial for your body and helps you to assimilate light, all of which seemed to be based on the facts and still to this day seems to be based on the facts. In fact, almost all of it, more and more evidence that comes out proves that these ideas are pretty directionally accurate. Wear blue light blocking glasses at night because artificial light at night disrupts our body's natural rhythm. Sunlight helps it, but bright light at night disrupts it. So wear these special glasses that block that light. I started a whole company based on this whole rabbit hole that I had gone down and it's become my livelihood and what I do and what I teach people about. So there is really, I wouldn't, if I felt that it was no longer valid, I wouldn't stick with it. I'm just getting to a point where I think it even goes deeper than this actually, but I'll explain how it all ties together. We can get into that later on. But anyway, I went deeper, 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 and deeper. I had even read some books about spirituality just through happenstance, through a blessing. And I started to have this idea. And I thought maybe I was like one of the first to have the idea, which also shows (laughs) I had no idea what I was talking about because many people have seen the link between Eastern ancient wisdom and Western modern science and have started to try to bridge the gap. Thankfully, I just felt sure that that was something I had to also contribute to at the time. I thought maybe it was my idea, (laughs) you know, right? No way. But, um, I remember reading Ram Dass, his book, Be Here Now, which is a really amazing kind of like deep dive into spirituality and kind of unification of different religions and so on. And I thought, wow, this makes a lot of sense. Like Jesus, who my Catholic grandparents were always worshiping, is telling the truth, according to this guy. And it's the same as all religions. That's really interesting. All of a sudden, I had a lot less 
judgment towards the faith that my grandparents are following that I always sort of felt a little uncomfortable with because my mother didn't follow it. And we always had to go to church once a year with them. And I wasn't really into it, but I always still, still was kind of something about it was appealing to me and I didn't know what. So that whole journey kind of was, was the background for me starting a business. The thing that shifted most recently, I would say on this time scale that, that really is the foundation for the conversation we can have today was after four years of running my business, uh, which was from when I graduated high school. So that was a four year kind of health journey. And then which faded into an entrepreneurship journey. And then I started the business after high school, built it up, tra- been traveling all around the world, meeting amazing people, learning different things. I was like crashing out still. So it was like, okay, I learned about something that's way deeper than food and it helped me heal significantly further physically speaking and mentally too, because there's a big interplay between the body and the physical body and the mind and so on. But I was still super stressed and not feeling super whole, you know, no matter how much sunlight I got, no matter how much I was connected to the ocean, no matter how much I boosted the dopamine levels in my brain. And I thought like, I can't keep doing this. It was like one of those moments where you're like, I surrender. I literally can't keep doing this. And I remembered, thank God, about this guy, Joe Dispenza, who I had heard about, who of all the spiritual teachers out there, he seemed like he figured it out. Like he had it. He just got it, you know? And you could like, I just knew, because there's all these people talking about all these different things. And I have to say, I'm actually one of them in this case. Not that it's good or bad. It's just, there's so many people making noise, sharing information. And I, I hope that mine is valuable to many people. It seems to be, but you know, I don't want to contribute to wasted space. Uh, you get the idea there. So this guy, Dr. Dispenza was someone who I felt like, okay, if I kind of tune out all the noise and I just focus, cause it's really hard to take in all that noise. If I just focus, I felt very confident more than with most other protocols that this would help me to the result I was then looking for, which was to be mentally in a better place and more calm and at peace. And so naturally I did the course because I was too lazy to read the books. No, I just, I felt, I felt like I was so busy and didn't have any time. So I did the course. And then as soon as he started offering in-person week-long retreats, I started attending those. The beginning with first was in the beginning of January this year. Now it's the almost middle of November. And I've now gone to four full week-long advanced retreats with Dr. Joe throughout this year and have learned a ton. The best part is that it wasn't fresh. It wasn't something brand new. It was something that I was able to build on top of so much experience taking me from Western medicine, naturopathy, diet, and trying all these strict healing diets to even, which I think very few people go through because it's just so unknown, light, photobiology, how light works in our body, and just a touch of spiritual ideas, just enough to kind of be dangerous to the point where I was now looking at the science of spirituality and so many things started to come together. I was like, oh my gosh, this is unbelievable. This is like, in other words, just in the same way that light alone, you know, sunlight blocking blue light alone isn't necessarily enough to heal, or I should say food alone isn't necessarily enough to heal um, a broken mitochondria, right? That's kind of the idea that I've shared on many podcasts throughout the past, maybe you've heard and so on. So we need light because light goes a level deeper, right? But then in the same way, even if we're getting all the sunlight, my experience showed me this isn't even my opinion. This is just me telling what I experienced all the sunlight, all the blocking blue light dialing in my circadian rhythm wasn't enough to heal emotional traumas and limited ways of thinking. And, and actually, in my case, specifically, there was an emotion of sadness that I was holding on to for such a long time. And no amount of sunlight, none was enough to cause me to release that. And as long as I held on to that, I would continue to feel that same way, that same emotion. So this was like another level deeper. And I'll add that it was foreshadowed because as I went through the light diet, there was like a eight step protocol that I put together that people can actually purchase on robdix.com and go and get the light diet PDF course. And it's actually a video course in a PDF form with the videos linked. And that's kind of the current evolution of light diet. I'm going to be releasing a new one. Actually, it's, it's a little antiquated, but still the most up-to-date of anything I've put out. But for a long time, I was looking like there's a missing step. Something's missing. And finally, I came to, it's got to be 
like our inner light, cultivating our inner light, taking care of it. Now, it didn't mean I knew how to do it. I just actually deferred people to people like Joe Dispenza and spiritual teachers saying this is really important. So this was my experience in, in detail, I would say, of, of how I got from where I started to sitting here on the phone with you and having a business making blue light blocking glasses. But now on Instagram, like you said, talking about things that aren't just related to dialing in circadian rhythms and mitochondrial function, which is still important, but how we can start to change our thinking. Cause this is what inspires me the most anyway. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for asking. <laughs> yeah. So this is what I'm excited to talk to you about because I know that, you know, you've been the the light expert, which of course you still are. And you've been on many podcasts talking about light. I think that people need to hear this more spiritual mindset side of things, because I, I think a lot of people have that same mentality that you had back when you were a teenager of, okay, as long as I fix my diet, then I'll be good. But then it goes a layer deeper than that. It's like, okay, well, you still got to get sunlight and you still got to exercise, but then you could be doing all of that right. And you have a poor mindset about it, or you're, you're holding on to these self-limiting beliefs and then nothing is going to work properly as you of course experienced. And as a holistic lifestyle specialist myself, I need to learn more about this too, because I'm teaching people about their diet, about movement, about sunlight. And of course they feel better, right? I had a client uh, the other day after listening to a bunch of your podcasts, he's been eating better. He's been sleeping better. I told him to go out and watch the sunrise. And in the afternoon, he would have these lulls and I'd say, okay, go spend 20 minutes outside. And even then he, he went outside and felt amazing, but still there's, you can feel there's something missing. And I think it's something either spiritually or mentally that he's holding on to. Uh, and I need to to get better at understanding this. W what was that course by Dr. Joe Dispenza? Let's do it. Well, he has online. I'm I'm uh, I love sharing everything he's doing. Uh, it is the online intensive and progressive course for people who want to go deeper. I'm like a walking billboard now for Joe Dispenza. <laughs> I hope <laughs> I hope he hears this. For everybody listening, if you don't know Dr. Joe Dispenza, um, I recommend subscribing to Gaia. TV, which is basically the, the personal development of Netflix and start by watching his rewired series on Gaia. I think that's a, that's a fantastic place to start learning from Joe, Dr. It's Joe. It's like Netflix is, is like the, I don't know if, even know if I should go try to go here, but Netflix is like the lowest common denominator and Gaia is like the highest common factor. Would yeah. Be a, a way to put it. Yeah. Gaia is, is, is amazing. I just watched yesterday. Um, two interviews with uh, Aubrey Marcus and then with um, Charles Eisenstein. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, okay. But let's get back into this conversation. So let's go a little bit deeper on what Dr. Joe Dispenza teaches and the, like how your thoughts play a role in yeah, so how you manifest. As soon as you, uh, and let's definitely touch on the idea of manifesting. That'd be really fun. But as you said earlier, about, you know, people think they need to do their diet and then they're good, or they need, you know, maybe even they get some sunlight and then they're good. Maybe they do their training and they're good. What I found really interesting, it sounds unfathomably simple, but you're not good until you're good. In other words, and I'm not saying this as a joke, mm -hmm. like for the longest time, probably the biggest issue that I, I have had and still experienced with some regularity, I'm not perfect by any means. I'm just learning and learning and trying to be more conscious throughout my days. The biggest thing that kept me thinking I wasn't right or good or this was literally thinking that I wasn't good. It's, I want to, I want to drill into this a little bit more. Like the way we live our life is our life. And this is, again, some, some may find these to be abstract concepts. They're really something worth listening and repeating if you're listening to this alone. For me, it, it took so long to understand what seems to be an extremely simple concept. Really, it seems to me, to me to be super simple. Like, I'll put it another way. The way I live my life is my life. You know, people say this, this idea of the present moment 
this present moment, you know? And for so long, it frustrated me beyond measure because I just could not wrap my head around like, what does it mean? I just don't, if I'm in the present moment, then what's going to take care of the future? Like I just didn't get it. Right. And I, I'm not sure I still get it at all, but at least I think I've made some progress in that direction. And so when I say the way I live, my life is my life. If the only time we have is what they call the present moment, you know, the, the moment we're currently occupying existing, which is continuous and ongoing. And that's all there is. And, you know, the sun rises, the sunsets, but it's all just this continuous present moment. Then the things that I'm thinking, the things that I'm choosing to do, those are my life. You would have to agree that the things that I choose to do and to fill, to fill my time are my life. Like for example, right now, my life is this podcast with you. This is my entire life. This is all there is. There's literally nothing else, no past, no future, just this podcast with you. So one of the things that I thought is maybe what the people talking about the present moment are saying is just, I'm doing this podcast with you. What if I pretended, and I like the idea of pretending, and we should get into this too, we will. What if I just pretended that this podcast with you right now, every single thing in my life, every single moment in my entire life, as we conceive of my entire life, what that means, you know, the, the memories I have and everything brought me to this moment, right? To this particular place and time speaking with you, it would behoove me that I do a good job with the situation, right? Why not? You know, that that's, I think what people are saying about the present moment. It's like in the podcast I told you, I did a few days ago, this is kind of one of the things we were getting into is like the experience I believe of, of human life is it couldn't be more drastic. Like the difference between absolute depression and absolute bliss and joy, like it is not static. It is, it is yeah. a massive spectrum. And the people who are in that absolute bliss and joy, like the question I would, I entertain myself and I suggest people entertain is what is that person's present moment experience like? Like, are they, I didn't get the job or I don't have the boyfriend or I don't have, or are they just like, are they like a child in heaven? Like Jesus <laughs> said, you know, are they just like so in rapture with the smell of a flower? And yeah. I've, for having spent so long refusing to be happy and refusing to appreciate the present moment, I can say, I kind of understand what it feels like. I still do it with some frequency, although I'm not very proud of it, but you know, and then in moments, just more and more frequently, I'll, I'll just, it, it'll be like someone punched me in the gut. And I'm like, oh my gosh, where am I? And so then the question, of course, that my ego mind wants to take, and this is something I've read, I've read I recall now Ram Das speaking through me writing, you know, the moment you try to grab it, it's gone. It's like somehow we have to walk this. Jesus said, narrow is the gate and straight is the way that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Like mm. somehow we have to walk this super narrow path, which is very difficult. And that's why not everyone's, if it was so easy to be super happy, you know, maybe everyone would be super happy, but it's, it's, as I'm understanding, like I said, about all, everything converging on this one moment, us doing this interview, I might as well bring a good effort to it, right? It's like, it's the same with everything in our lives. Like we can choose, are we going to go in here? Are we going to put in an effort? Are we going to choose to to walk that path and and be in the present moment and just surrender our thoughts and fears and worries? Or are we going to choose to latch on to worries? And I want to tell you about... Uh, to kind of further this about an experience I had just yesterday, I was with my girlfriend and we were going for a walk. That was beautiful, by the way. I saw that on your Instagram story. Oh, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. We're in Sardinia. It's raining. It's, it's still raining like that today. The clouds are everywhere. The water's like a light blue. It's unbelievable. Yeah. I've been at a friend's house here for a few weeks now. Uh, my friends are out in Costa Rica, which is blessed. So we just got to stay here at this big house right on the water. So lucky. So blessed actually. You know, we've we've sort of in our own way earned this and we can talk about that to earn manifested however we want to say. But basically, we went walking. I'm looking that way because that's kind of where we went walking. And we were sitting on a rock at in front of this old Sardinian castle where there was a writing on the wall that was saying that it was defending Sardinia, the south of Sardinia from Turkish pirate invasions hundreds of years ago. I was like, that's kind of cool. Like 
yeah. where we are right now, like imagining Turkish pirates and stuff fighting here. Like, you know, and I, one good question asked is like, what's, what's the difference between now and then? Like, you know, okay. We, people could say time, like it's just, we've gone around the sun a certain amount of times, like really nothing's all that different, you know? Anyway. So we were having a conversation about something actually related to sex. And I'll just be, I like being transparent and honest here. Why not? It helps with everything. So, you know, not feeling like we have to hold back. That's another idea worth diving into, like just not holding back and telling the truth. So one thing I thought about is that in the practice of, of making love or having sex or something like we can choose, this is how this conversation kind of started with her. And I was like, we can choose to basically accept like, okay, I'm Matt and this is my girlfriend and, and we're here and I was born here and I lived here and this is my, and like all of a sudden this making love is like sort of becomes like maybe a routine. Like you can be conscious and present, but it's like, it's, it, it, it's just part of the story. It's part of the known, I'll say. For me, it, it becomes less interesting or because why not? I thought like we could quote unquote pretend and I use the word pretend loosely just because it's the best word I know to trigger the what I'm trying to express in people's brains. But so imagine that that's used loosely. The word pretend to be like a god and a goddess who are transported from a foreign land to this earth and we're here to save humanity. And this moment, again, like making love is like, everything has brought us to this moment. And like, it's, it's incumbent upon us to, to do a good job with this act, you know, and treat it as sacred and be present. Like people talk about, which for me is still difficult in many different situations, even in the process of making love. Like I noticed my mind wandering, like this is, this is the path though. It's not, it's just not beating yourself up. It's trying to come back to that fine, narrow path. And, and of presence, which is difficult in mm-hmm. many ways, but, you know, maybe it becomes easy after a while. We'll see. So basically this was, this was part of a conversation. And I think what her question was to me, like, well, why would you, why would you do that? Like what just genuinely, like, why would you do that? Why wouldn't you just be present in your body with the moment? I was like, there's no reason the two can't be together. Like there's no reason that pretending to be, someone that that isn't in the mind. You don't have to be thinking in the mind. You can be that person in the moment. And this is what, as I understand it, is the teaching of Dr. Joe Dispenza and maybe some other masters too. It's to imagine who you could be or who you want to be or the most amazing thing you could imagine and bring it to the present moment and become that person. Pretending is the word I use loosely. But the reason I say it's pretending is loose is because if I'm quote unquote pretending to be, you know, this sort of a God, let's just say, or I'm pretending or I'm, I'm being quote unquote, I'm just being the person who I think I am with my past memories. Like what's the difference, you know? And the, 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 the critic skeptic might just say, well, the difference is one is true and the other is not, you know? And it's like, okay, well, if that's what you want to believe, you can stay in your, you know, everything, keep running with that one and, and enjoy But really, as we've discussed earlier on, this is why I like kind of starting with that. If the whole past stories we're telling ourselves are all sort of just selective memories, we don't even really know exactly what happens. It's all just in a memory bank. Like we don't even really know. Is it more interesting to be that person or is it more interesting to choose to be someone important or someone special or something special, you know? And, and I used the example to her in that moment because she was asking the question related to making love. But I use the example of, well, wait, we're sitting on this rock, right? And I could just say, well, I'm Matt and you're Radha and that's her name, Radha. And, you know, we're, we're here and, you know, we're... I was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, United States of America, and you were born in Russia. And, and we met a few months ago and we came together and we've been traveling and blah, 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 blah. And, and now we're here in Sardinia, Italy, the country of Italy. And, and we're staying at our friend's house. And I was like, these are all the knowns. And that's fine. Cause like, that's what we know. Like, why can't we just say, just for example, again, people think I'm crazy, but why couldn't we just, for example, say, we, like I was getting at earlier, we are these supernatural beings transported here from a foreign land and we're, and we're on this earth 
this, 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 we don't even know what earth is, but we're on this, in this experience, in this moment, we see these things where we call mountains, but who knows what they are, these structures of rock, what we call rock and this liquid water. And in a, in a moment, the whole thing can become more magical. Now, I'm not saying that necessarily if someone isn't interested, they should walk around all day and just say, well, I'm like a kid, like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm the captain and this and that. I'm not saying you have to do that, but it's this sort of practicing being happy. It's practicing being inspired. It's pretending, but actually embodying it and becoming it. It's this pretending that I learned that is sort of the, the, the lock the, the way to go from being miserable to being happy in my experience, because people who are happy, somehow the ones who are just happy by default, maybe they were just born and raised like that. And they live like that their whole life, usually unlikely, probably more, more often, although it's possible they had maybe great parents and they were raised with this sense of wholeness and love, which is very possible. Actually, oftentimes I think people have gone through such misery that they've made up their mind that they weren't going to let small things make them upset and miserable. You know, like they weren't going to let, like they maybe were a Holocaust survivor or who knows, like, and they chose that like the little things, they're just going to be grateful for their life. And I spent so much time over the last few years and even my whole life thinking like, gosh, I've never, and I, I, I'm grateful in a way, but I've never had to go through severe hardship. Like I've never been tortured. I've never been stranded. I've never been put in jail. Like I basically had no hardship and I could actually see how that resulted in my level of gratitude in my life. Like I wasn't grateful for almost anything for the longest time. I'm still not as nearly as grateful as I'd like to be. Now I should be careful when I say that because what we say is oh. what we become as I'm sharing here. So I have to be very careful. I actually want to retract that statement. Good. I'm a pretty great rephrase person, it. Actually. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually a pretty grateful person. There's always more to discover, but I'm actually very grateful for my life. So see, this is another example. Just me saying, ah, well, I could be more grateful. The thought, as soon as I put, so everything is oneness, right? In the present moment, let's just say. Just the thought or me, even the thought, even not saying it, the thought that, well, you know what? I could be more grateful. It immediately separates me from being more grateful. Yeah. Instead, if I just started sitting and feeling and saying, you know what? Like, I'm really grateful for my life. Like, you know, I have really great parents. I have really, and it's not, it's not faking it. I used to try to fake it too. People say, write down all the things you're grateful for and journal it. The real practice that I learned from some of these Joe Dispenza events, and it's really difficult, it's not super easy, is learning how to actually put that new outfit on and feel it. And yep. sometimes this is where meditation comes in. Sometimes you have to slow down your brain waves, and that way you can get into your subconscious mind. And slowing down your brain waves is a synonym for chill out and stop running the old patterns. This is difficult, though. This is why. Again, I, I don't claim that I'm a perfect teacher of these ideas. And some of these are mine. Some of the things I've learned from different masters, some from Joe Dispenza, who I'm mentioning a lot here because he's been a profound impact and uses a lot of science and explains things really well. But this is why people learn to meditate because they can slow down their brain waves. And in the process, when I go in and I meditate and I slow down my brain waves, what I'm basically doing is taming my body in a way like a dog. It's like, I want to go, I want to go, I want to go, I want to go, I want to go. Or oftentimes what it's been recently in many cases, because I'm still overcoming, I'm overcoming many past patterns and emotions. My body, want, I can feel it sometimes. It wants to be sad. It wants to be depressed. It wants to make people feel bad with me, like whoever I'm with. It wants me to be miserable and be sad. It want, you know, to, to be a stressed and, and terrified about my business and that I'm going to fail and that my competition's crushing me and all this stuff. And like what I'm learning to do, I would buy into all of that. And I would run with this energy. This is the character I'm pretending to be. That, that's the basically what I'm pretending, you know, but it, it, in effect, it was sub, it was the default. I was still pretending, but it was default in this case. And then all my life's actions would actually reflect that because I would go from that energy and cr create more of that in reality. In other words, energy is where things start and then matter manifests around energy. So basically our body is a holographic manifestation of our soul. So our soul exists first and our body is an energy, like something that's more material, tangible, but is guided by the soul, the energy field. Some call it an energy field, the bio 
electromagnetic researchers I was studying it called it energy field. Some people called it a soul, a spirit, same ballpark of ideas. That is where energy manifests from. And in the same way, and this is where the, the word karma comes into play. If I'm super stressed and I go out and start working, I've learned that it's better that I didn't work at all because I actually create more karma as they say in the ancient Hindu scriptures, I'm creating more crap that I'm going to have to clean up. When I take that energy, instead of taming it and correcting my perception, for example, if I'm dealing with emails, I will go in and respond to emails that I should have deleted. And then those people will respond to me and I'll have to deal with it again. And then I'll be triggered by it because I didn't tame that energy when it came up. This is one example people could relate to. I'll go out and I'll go do projects or initiate projects that I don't even want to do because I was rushing from a place of like, I see another company that's doing really well. I need to do what they're doing. No, it's, 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 so I have to like constantly catch myself and tame myself now. And it's difficult. And I, I fail, I fail all the time, but I'm just getting started. So the re the story really that I was telling is, you know, starting with, we're not good until we're, we say we're good. And then this idea of pretending sitting on that rock, it's like, as it relates to me and how I can share this experience with people so that people can understand that this isn't just a bunch of intellectual ideas was when the moment that was one of the, the most profound moments that I've experienced with this practice of listening and trying to observe these subconscious programs and seeing where they're directing me was when in somehow in one meditation, after many meditations, lots of crying, many releases over many months at these dispensa events. And I kept going back because there was something I wanted to find. And, and I, I think I may have found it. It was, it was in one particular meditation, I was crying and feeling sad and, I, and, and he says that whenever you feel like you're at the edge, that's when you got more to go, you know? And if, for example, if we can't just sit and relax with our eyes closed, like seriously, this is going to segue towards where you want to go about the Instagram posts. And I'd love to go that direction. I'll just briefly mention this. But when we close our eyes, that is our world. We know even from science that the world that we are experiencing is inside of us. Even anyone can, almost anyone can grasp this. You know, the things we see, they're all outside of us, but we're not experiencing outside of us. Or maybe we are. Some spiritualists might say, actually, we're one with that experience. But from a scientific limited perspective, which is useful for the purposes of this explanation, actually, the light is coming and striking our brain and creating some experience within us, right? Which is, is here. And the information that is outside of us is just electromagnetic information. Also, you know, uh, sound information. None of it has an innate meaning. None of your, your mother calling you, your girlfriend calling you, someone even having sex. None of this has an innate meaning. Sex only has a meaning because we have this meaning that we remember what it is because of the stories that have been told throughout history as that this is a way to procreate, but it's also a very pleasurable act that two people who love each other or, or just want to get off can engage in. And that's uh, none of it necessarily has an innate meaning to it by itself. It's just information from a very limited, let's just say, um, limiting scientific perspective, which is, again, good for the purposes of what I'm trying to describe here. Actually, this is what science believes right now, and it can be helpful. So that information comes in and it, in some way, the meaning is entirely ascribed based on how we interpret it. You know, what do, what is, what do I believe the sea, the ocean to be? For me, the sea, the ocean, it's a place where I've had fun since I was a kid, boats, stories, pirates. What about someone who never, ever, ever, ever saw a movie about anything with a boat or anything with the ocean, and they never saw the ocean before? The ocean might be maybe the scariest thing in the world or the most exciting thing in the world. Their, ex their experience, like I was saying earlier about the massive scope of human experience from super depressed to super blissed, enlightened joy, like the experience of just something as simple as what we consider the ocean or the sea, the Mediterranean Sea I'm looking at right now, often to the horizon, it's, it's could be from you know, sun to moon, it could be completely different for two different people, right? So what I'm getting at is with, so after many months of going through many different releases and having so many experiences, I finally 
would, and I would go as I, this is what I was getting at was I would be in my meditations and I would be coming over the edge. You know, whenever we get to the edge, that is where our beliefs are at our limit. And that's the thing that is basically stopping us. So the story, the reason I bring up this experience of the ocean can be totally different. It's to explain that if someone closes their eyes and sits in meditation and is miserable, as I, as I believe and understand, and they can't chill, they can't even, they feel like they're going to die. That is that person's experience of life because the world is happening within us, right? So you see how this kind of fits together. And so the process of meditation is just closing your eyes and it's not doing anything different. It's just closing your eyes and saying, this is what I'm working with. When I open my eyes, all of that, all of the things I'm interpreting are being layered on top of what's here at, at a baseline. And so when you close your eyes and you're a baseline, you're miserable. Wow. You better believe that when you go to work, it's going to be a really bad day. And yeah. when you go to school, it's going to be really difficult and everything's going to be miserable and everyone's going to hate you. And everyone's going to be an actually not hate you. Everyone's going to be an asshole. So we project outward onto people, our own experience. So we call people assholes. It is a plus positive and negative exact corollary for us being completely intolerant and entitled. Yeah. That is what, when we say you're an asshole, it means really what we should say is I'm intolerant and in entitled. And I have no capacity to, to have love and compassion for my brothers and sisters. It is exactly why Jesus said thousands of years ago, as, as I understand, he said, why do you judge your brother first before you look in your own eye and cast out the the evil basically that's in your own eye and then you know look at your brother it's always within us first so that's why just so people understand the process of meditation in in some practices is to just sit and become familiar with your thoughts and what's going on and every time there's the fly or the thing or the stimulus or anything like this that's the next thing to overcome. Like if there's a fly that lands on my face now, I try to just let it have its fun and just relax. And, and then I start laughing. Yeah, I start laughing. I'm like, wow, that was so easy. And before I'd be like smacking myself, <laughs> trying to like doing like a jumping around, like karate chops, the whole thing. So anyway, back to this sort of discovery, this breakthrough I was having, it was after many, many, many months of this practice of overcoming, overcoming, overcoming. And I was at this point where I was just crying and feeling kind of like sad. And I finally, it clicked this greater level of mind that I was applying to everything else in my life. We have to look for where are we willing to apply a greater level of mind in our life to everything. And then and then there's something where it's the exception. We won't look at that thing. That's where we need to go. It's like the thing that we want, we do not want to look at, you know, and I have plenty of things I still am excited to look at, even though they make me uncomfortable. But so this one, I was like, ha ha, I've been doing all this work and I'm sitting here and I had this great release, but I'm still, I'm still sitting here crying. I'm still like, but, but like not enjoy, like still sadness. Like I'm attaching to the sadness. I was like, ah, it just became certain things. They just clicked. I was like, I, in that moment, I thought, not now, but in that moment, I felt, I really want to be sad. I'm, I'm take pleasure in being sad. And of course, my analytical mind that wants to understand stuff started asking, well, was it because, you know, I just go down this path, even though I probably wouldn't be, <laughs> it's not the smartest thing to do, but actually I won't. <laughs> no, I went down the path and thought about what it could be for my past that made me feel sad. And different things that, that could have happened that, you know, as a young kid and, um, you know, parents divorced, this and that, what, what was it, you know, and, and try to pinpoint it so that I could blame and actually use that to reinforce the emotion. That's what we do. So we, we can identify as it, but the better thing to do is just become aware of it and not cling onto it. Cause then we're just trying to fuel it further yeah. and just move on. And that's so difficult, but becoming aware of it day by day by day, we can start to be free. So yeah. this, is, this is really my best way I can explain this idea of changing our beliefs and, and creating the reality we want to exist in internally, because then everything we experience externally becomes part of that heaven we can create as opposed to some hell on earth. Yeah, there's, and there's a couple of things uh, I want to unpack. First off, the the fly reference that is extremely relatable. I, I go outside and read sometimes, and I'm just trying to have a, a nice, relaxing, uh, you know, read. And then there's flies all around, and they're landing on me. And I, of course, get annoyed in the moment. And then as soon as I get annoyed, 
I realize the fact that I'm annoyed at mother nature, just being mother nature. And it's like, I need to control this, right? Because it does me no good. If I get angry at a fly, flies are not going away. They're going to continue to, to <laughs> you know, seemingly yeah. be annoying. It's just, I have to change my reaction towards that. And, and that's, that's what you were talking about. And then I was reading uh, Charles Eisenstein's book, um, Sacred Economics. And in the introduction, he mentions that gratitude is our default state. But then we start to lose that for you know, whatever reason. And if you think about it, when you're born, even if you were born in the shittiest of, of circumstances and you're still alive today, somebody was, was taking care of you. Because as a newborn baby, you can't do anything. You're, you're helpless. So our default state is gratitude because when we're a newborn baby and we can't do anything, we don't deserve to be taken care of. We haven't done anything to deserve us being taken care of. So we are, of course, naturally grateful for that person. We want to, to give back to them. Um, but then some, you know, whenever down the line, we, we forget about that and then we lose touch with we start to become entitled and think we deserve these certain things and we're not grateful anymore. And that's, that can obviously cause a lot of issues. And then you were talking about how some people can just be born naturally happier, which I is the case. I just finished taking a, a Jordan Peterson course on personality and there's these five different personality. Um, I believe they're traits and you, you can't change it. That's just basically who you are. You can work on improving them, but the one that relates to happiness specifically is neuroticism. So if somebody is high in neuroticism, they are naturally going to be sad and have these depressive thoughts, but that doesn't mean that you can't change them, right? So it, it may be harder for some people. For me, I'm extremely low in neuroticism. So I'm just generally naturally happier. Um, and so I think it would be helpful for people out there to take this, uh, this personality quiz basically to find out if you're high or low in neuroticism. And then if you're high in neuroticism, this becomes even more important for you to do these, these internal thoughts. And then that brings us to language and the language that you use as you were saying, literally determines how you feel and how you experience the world. One of my favorite quotes is from Shakespeare. Nothing is either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. And you can literally choose how you feel in certain situations. That doesn't mean that it's easy, right? It, it takes practice. Just like me trying to not be annoyed with flies. It takes practice consistently. <sighs> Well, I could just touch on two things there. One is, I think I get what you're getting at about be babies being grateful um, naturally. The one thing I would be careful of or just consider is whether babies actually don't deserve to be taken care of, because I believe that babies do deserve to be taken care of because they, even they, they don't know it, whoever's choice it is to bring the baby into the world. I believe the baby, babies deserve to be taken care of more than almost anyone else actually, um, first of all. And then secondly, about the Jordan Peterson test, I would just say that I'm very, very skeptical of these types of personality tests. I love and respect Dr. Peterson very much, but you know, he too is, is known, it seems to be uh, struggling with tremendous amounts of uh, mental challenges. And, you know, maybe as a result of his work or past, I don't know, but um, I do not believe that th these tests are, are necessarily accurate. In other words, the science that Dr. Dispenza is looking at shows that actually anyone can change. They have people who are the most depressed, the most, you know, and they change and they heal themselves permanently of their depression. So again, it, it seems benign to say, well, oh, but some people, you know, we can all still change it, but some people are more or less inclined towards neuroticism. But these are the types of thoughts that I think people actually need to be super careful of because people who are attaching for whatever reason, whether it was an event or not an event or whatever, that 
caused them to be in this emotion, whatever it was, the cause is really relevant. They're attaching to a certain emotion and that's where they are in their life and their experience. The, because the energy is guiding, these people will look for justification. I've done this, you know, like we'll look for something to latch onto that can, they can use to get off the hook. I'm this way because or, this, this, yes, this. I'm this way. And, and I have this test where I have anxiety, big one. I have anxiety. I have depression, you know, so they don't ever have to look at themselves and then they can continue going. It's, it's an addiction for sure. I mean, I'm, I'm, I've been, I've been there. I've been there and it's not fun. And it's, it's really, really it can be difficult. It can feel difficult in the moment. It actually, it's only as hard as we want to make it. That's the thing. It's only ever as hard as we want to make it to be free. But we choose to stay in this addiction because it actually, this is the crazy thing. It feels good. It feels good to hurt people, to judge people. And I hate to admit this. I don't like, I don't like to admit this, but it, it, it feels good to be upset and to judge people. I mean, at, in a really superficial way, in a really shallow way, but it can feel good and rewarding. Now, it's so it's easier to stay there, but that's why every movie, every film, everything about the hero's journey is that it's the harder path, but the more courageous path. Like I saw Peterson tweeted recently, the most, the best man is the one who has the capacity to do great evil and cause great suffering, but doesn't. Yeah. The one who, who has no capacity to do so is, is harmless. Mm -hmm. But the one who does and chooses not to, as opposed to choosing to do so, is the greatest, the strongest, the most powerful, the best in his opinion. And I agree with him on this because this is the choice isn't when you know, it's one thing, again, this is almost, these are biblical principles. Like it's one thing to say, and I've done this before, actually, I did this. I po made a post on Instagram years ago, like, oh, like it's so good to be like, you know, sell, like not celibate, but like, you know, restraining the sexual urge, blah, blah, blah. Like, actually, no, I was just in a place biologically where my body wasn't functioning because I was in chronic stress. So I didn't have a sexual urge. So it's easy to be like, oh yeah, like I'm, you know, like, Hootie tootie, I'm cool. I, I'm I'm spiritual. I'm resisting the urge of sexual pleasure. When you don't have that strong primal desire, it's another thing when you do have it, you know, or you're in a relationship and you have that right available and you restrain yourself. It's just like, again, Jesus said in the Bible, like there's some men who are wealthy and giving some of their money to some poor person. And then some poor woman comes along and gives everything she has and Jesus basically says to his disciples, you see these men who give from everything they have, this is, you know, this is okay. But the woman who gives from everything, she is the one who is, you know, will be rewarded the most. It's like it, this, it's sort of these, these almost seemingly paradoxical ideas that are so, so worth remembering because this is how, at least for me, we can start to find the path. And I'll add, I think it, it, it reminds me of Nazi Germany, actually. It comes to mind in this conversation of how it actually feels good to be evil. Like Peterson talks about this a lot too. Like people, I believe, take for granted that Nazi Germany and this whole situation, even, you know, the situation in communist Russia and the ongoing issues all over the world, that these happen these happened less than a hundred years ago and are still happening in many places. You know, like we, I don't want to say our natural tendency is to be evil, but it seems to be the case that what, of what we can maybe see right now, a, a highly observed tendency is to be evil. And so for someone to just, it seems to be the assumption though, of your average person in the Western world, at least that I'm familiar with, that they are good, a good person. And yet, how is it possible that we could see such horrific events if the average person was just good? I personally would gander that the person who gets angry and judges the next person in traffic and gets frustrated would, you know, you give them to, to just to be honest, sometimes, you know, you give that man, that angry man, a machine gun and give him power and tell him that he's like in charge. He will, he will maybe would be the, the Nazi guards that, you know, Peterson yeah. talks about this sort of phenomenon. I even experienced it the other day. I was on an airplane flying from Milan to Sardinia 
And the, the Ryan Air, which is a notoriously bad airline, but because the Italian airlines went under in COVID, it's like the main airline in Italy. So you really can't get anywhere without dealing with the non-existent customer support and nightmare that is Ryan Air. Uh, but nonetheless, the guy, the, the flight attendant in the back, I just was trying to be friendly. I was like, where are you from? Like, where are you from? And he's like, I, he's, his exact words were, I'm from where you're going. So you better behave yourself. I was like, Wow. This is a flight attendant. Like this guy for sure would be like wielding the like he'd be the torturer at the at the Nazi concentration camp. Like God, God love his soul. I shouldn't even be saying this because again, it's I perpetuate some of these negative energies by even using words like this. A true master, they don't even talk like this, but in certain respects. But at least I think we can all be better, right? But I'm using this to demonstrate a point, which is that like it's so much more insidious than we think. If you think you don't have it, you probably do. Like, that's the thing. We have to become so aware of our tendency to want to hurt, to want to be evil. I've seen in my, I see it in myself, you know, like to, I, to come face to face with like the, and this, especially when it had, you had someone else involved to see like, wow, I actually took pleasure in hurting that person emotionally, maybe not physically, but emotionally, mm -hmm. you know, or using that person or, or or neglecting that person, but because I knew it hurt them, you know, they say some people, there's a saying like, you know, it's, it's one thing to hurt the people you don't know. It's, it's like the people we know better, the more you can hurt them passively, aggressively, passive, aggressively, deeply, you know, it's, yeah. so those are the tendencies we can become aware of and start to choose. And the, this is the really interesting thing that again, I'm going to recommend people now also listen to the other podcast I did because this one and the last one I've, I've done are completely different from any other podcast I've ever done. This other one was on a show called The Carnivore Yogi, but I'll, I'll reshare many of the ideas here um, and we'll get into many other things as well. I'll leave it at that for now, actually. This is, okay. this is thorough. People get the idea. Okay. <clears throat> so I can just reaffirm your statement that yes, I believe that we have it in us to be evil. I myself used to be, I wouldn't necessarily say evil, but I could have absolutely been a Nazi dictator, 100%. And the more that I go down this path of understanding like love and compassion and empathy, and even that flight attendant, like I believe that everybody in the world has the capacity to be a truly good person. I believe that it's just their upbringing, how they were raised, their circumstances. Maybe he had three hours of sleep and, you know, his, his dog just died or what we have no idea what, what was going on. You're right. Thank right? you. And to, this is something that I've struggled with too, because I always used to judge people, but in, we, in reality, we really have no idea why they are the way that they are. And it does us no good to hold that grudge against them. Yeah. I, I think that everybody can change. It's just a lot. It's harder for a lot of different people based on their circumstances and the, the resources that they have available. I have to say you, you nailed it. It does us no good to hold that grudge against that person. What I'm trying to go even deeper with to the best of my ability here is not only does it not do us any good, it actually creates the problem. That is the problem because think about it. That guy's experience of the world and what he said to me if what I'm telling is true, that my experience is happening inside of me, mm -hmm. the only reason I'm even retelling this story now in this podcast is because in that moment, instead of choosing to take the pain that I perceived that he was projecting onto me and transmute it into love, and yeah. first you have to feel the pain. That's what I was kind of getting at earlier. And I held myself because I wanted to bring it up in a different moment. But basically, the 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 path of the master it seems to be the case to me isn't just to hold pain it's to transmute pain and this is the spiritual path and this is why many people don't want to do it because you have to feel pain but it's feeling pain and turning it into love it's just like an alchemist taking base metals and turning them into gold this is the path of of our life that we actually get to do and i would even say that the people who do this the most are the ones who are most rewarded as some spiritual you know, practices or religions say in the eyes of God or whatever. It's 
it's the, 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 and Peterson, I actually saw him tweet this recently. The joy we experience in our life, something like this is in direct proportion, he believes, to the amount of responsibility that we decide to carry. And I thought, you know what? That sounds a lot like these spiritual ideas. The more pain that I am willing to embrace from other people that isn't maybe even mine. I mean, start with my own first, for sure. There's plenty to work with there from, you know, my own judgments and hatred and bitterness and all these things. But, but once they, you know, once one works through their own and they choose that they want to be willing, not just to be blissed out themselves, but they're willing to go back into the world and take other people's pain. This is what the masters do. They literally have perfected themselves as far as their emotions and these things. And they just choose that they're just not going to be that person anymore. They're, it's, no, it's no longer a part of them. They are the master. You know, They're the person, the, the Ronaldo, who can score a million goals and doesn't even think about it. Like me kicking a ball into a soccer net versus Ronaldo. That is the difference between maybe the average person and a master. And, and I don't play soccer. That's the, that's the idea here. That's the difference between the average person and their emotions and a master. Like they don't think about it. They don't think I'm, am I on, uh, maybe I'm depressed. Maybe they have a doubt here and there, maybe, but true masters probably don't. They're the guru. They're enlightened. You know, people worship them because they have, chosen to experience and feel as much pain as comes their way so that they can purify people. They're just using their body. They don't even, they're not trying to take something or get something. They're using their body as a vessel to feel pain and transmute it. This is what Jesus did. And it was so much like people were so upset. It seems according to history books with Jesus choosing to take their pain. Cause the thing is, as I understand it, the people who crucified Jesus they wanted people to feel pain. They were in that emotion. They wanted people to struggle. And when someone said, you give me everything you got, I'll take it all. I'll take all of it. They said, no, it's, it was, it's like a black hole. Jesus was like a black hole in which pain, hatred, bitterness could go, and it would be transmu- received and transmuted into love. And so that's what happened. And that's why the story is still told, because he took everything, including violently murdering him and crucifying him. He took all of it and, tra- and still loved them the whole time. That is. That is the path of the master. That's why that's the longest lived story and one of not the longest lived, but one of definitely the most impactful story in all of Western civilization and the most, I believe, printed and read book in the world, the Bible. Um, anyway, so me judging that guy, it's perfect. I can, I can publicly acknowledge my error and we can learn the lesson here. I, in my universe, created this guy to be a bad guy because of my own lack of compassion, intolerance, exactly what I was speaking about earlier. If I had said chose, like you said, to, to, to take that pain and transmute it, it would hurt. I'd have to face myself. I'd have to face my own lack of love, judgment, Ego. bitterness, whatever it was that I was judging this guy instead of saying, poor soul, poor soul, maybe poor soul, maybe this guy's in pain. Maybe he's maybe realistically, because it's not actually, I'm not, we're not making this up either. You know that like the people who feel like that, can you imagine what it's like to be then their, their world must be difficult. You know, their life must be difficult being a flight attendant for a super, I mean, I don't even need to get in for an airline that doesn't even treat its customers. Well, imagine how it treats its employees, you know? So it's like, anyway, Glad you touched on that because it's it's really important for me that you know we talk we we throw around these cliches because and I did too I've been doing this for a long time because we don't know any better like we say we create the problem no we have to go deeper and say we we really create the problem because if if the world that we experience is only our experience by judging someone we create the person to be bad and another way to say this like we were getting at earlier is. You know, when you, when someone cuts you off in traffic and you judge them and, and you feel, oh, I'm so triggered, like, oh, so frustrated, like that person's gone. They're in a different, their universe. That's not, this is, that's not, uh, this is our universe. That's their universe. We make our universe miserable by latching on. So this is why so many masters, as I understand it, so many masters, so many teachers, they all say, work on yourself, work on yourself, work on yourself. It's hard. <laughs> it's supposed to be hard. So yeah, th- this leads to. Uh, your most recent quantum field report where you mentioned that all of the problems that we have or that we perceive to have is because of us is because of our own perceived you know notions about what's going on and i put this out on social media after hearing hearing you say that and then 
after also reading Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, it just kind of clicked. Like we really do create every single problem that we are experiencing. And I put this out there on social media and a lot of people didn't understand because they're like, oh, well, in, you know, communist North Korea, like those people have no control over what's going on to them. Like, False. It, yeah. It, the, the people in the careful. Holocaust, like all of these things, whether you're impoverished or in wrongly in prison, you know, whatever. And it's like, yes, right. Got that. You, you can't directly control these external circumstances that you're experiencing, but what you can control is how you feel and how you respond to those situations, right? Like, yes, those may be horrible circumstances, but they don't have to be, right? And that's extremely difficult depending on the severity of the situation you're in, like Viktor Frankl and the Holocaust, like that's unimaginably difficult, but yet he was still able to come out of it even better than he was before and to find meaning in it. So I just really want to drive that point home for people that you are the cause of and solution to all of the problems that you're experiencing. Yeah, for sure. Do you think, do you think that people have to experience pain or hardship to understand this? That's a really good question. Because I know for me, I was only able to... I just recently went through a breakup with my girlfriend of the the past four years, and it has been extremely difficult for me, by far the most depressed that I've ever been. And I never would have thought that I would, I would experience that. Um, and it was difficult. It, it took a, a hit on my productivity in business, um, obviously my emotions, because I understood how how much I had hurt her over the past few years without even knowing it because I had never experienced anything like she was explaining to me in the past. She would tell me that she wanted more love and she didn't feel love for me. And I just didn't get it. Right. I I thought, Oh, she's just, you know, being dramatic or emotional or whatever. But then once it actually happened and then we were separated, I was like, Holy shit. I was the major cause. Well, obviously it goes both ways because she, as we're talking now, like, she has control and I have control, but whatever. In, in my mind, I was the cause of this, you know, bad relationship just because I wasn't there emotionally. And it took me having experienced that loss to understand where she was coming from. And now that I understand that, my world has changed completely. And I really think that I couldn't have come to this conclusion any other way than by experiencing. I send you love because it's a difficult thing, you know, and I, I recently, I'll share how I recently went through something that felt, you know, that gave me a taste of sight so, so that I could be able to somewhat understand what you're describing. But I don't know right off the bat if people need to, it, for me, it definitely helped like experiencing these, uh, this pain, some pain, was the greatest, you know, teacher I've had. So I, I look at pain now as sort of like the, you know, it's the, it's the, the teachers that the universe gives us actually, because like, I wouldn't, I'm not interested in inflicting pain upon myself. However, if I have a, a situation that comes to me that hurts, that, that feels like pain, what I understand is that, okay, physical pain is one thing, you know, there's not thankfully too many situations that I'm in, encountering physical pain. And if I do, it's a great opportunity to grow and overcome the attachment to not being in physical pain, which sounds probably crazy to people. But one of the things I've understood is that we are one with everything in the universe. And the human experience is really, really unusual. It's really unusual. Like we're on this ball of lava flying through the cosmos and the sky. And it's just unusual. You know, we're, we're, we're sort of like, there's, a, there's an odds that we're going to feel pain. You know, I've thought about this recently. I was like, it could be the case that the worst pain I'm ever going to feel in my life, I haven't felt yet physical or suffering, like it's coming. And yet I still choose to live on in spite of that, the potential of being in horrific pain, maybe breaking in a limb. I don't, I'm not going to manifest that. So and I'm going to actually build a field of that not happening. Right. But what I'm getting at is 
maybe a, a, someone who's very wise could learn and be enlightened even or reach high levels of awareness without feeling pain. But I think for most people, pain is the teacher, not necessarily just physical pain, but some form of suffering, because that suffering is showing you where you have resistance. You know, again, it, it, these things, I hear myself say them, sometimes they sound like a cliche, but it's because it's true. Like the pain, the information that's coming in, even the sensation of pain is innate, doesn't innately necessarily have a meaning to it. It's just tremendous activation of the nervous system, what we call pain, you know, but suffering, the master say is when you take pain and you magnify it a million times and that's suffering and it's way worse than pain, like such that Jesus could be crucified and not suffer because he just didn't let the pain, his mind was so strong that he was stronger than the physical pain that he was feeling. And that like, if you've seen Braveheart, like William Wallace was literally stretched to death and, you know, like basically drawn and quartered and stretched and, and he he was like laughing at his death like he was just overcome with with vigor and alive now of course it's a movie but was it like that who knows but yeah. you get the idea so i, I want to make that people, di distinction yeah, for people please. that pain is the physical pain that you're feeling but suffering is how you choose to respond to that physical pain or, or sensation or even emotional it's you choose whether or not you suffer. You can't necessarily choose whether or not you feel pain because unless you have some crazy disease where your, your nervous system doesn't work, you're going to feel the pain, but you choose how you respond to that pain. Yeah, exactly. And even the word pain is sort of gives it a negative connotation, at least as the way I understand language and the way we typically most, I think, understand it. Like maybe a substitute for pain would be stimulation. Like mm. it, it's really just a very powerful stimulation yeah. that we, we label it and, and make it negative anyway. So the story I'd like to share just to, to relate actually is that I, I recently went through a very similar sort of situation that opened my capacity to see the world differently. And basically what, what happened was, so I met someone and over over so, yeah, some time ago, over a year, year and a half ago, and got into a relationship. It was one of my, I'm 22 years old. So I've been sort of, even though I've been doing this uh, business stuff and work stuff for a long time, as far as like mature relationships, wasn't really a focus because I was in high school, obsessed with my health and running a business, traveling, not mentally in a place where a relationship, like I had an availability or openness to that, even if there was something that yeah. may have come along. So basically like my first adult relationship I'm in and I connect with someone and I'm feeling like these emotions of love and like, we're, we're really connected. The present moment was great. It was really fun. And, you know, then I would have this fear that would like take over and, you know, this emotion. And to me, it felt like I was just protecting myself. Like I was just being rational in those moments. I just, I didn't think it was fear. I just thought I was being rational and like, uh, I don't really know. You know, I never even wanted to be calling the relationship boyfriend, girlfriend or anything like that. Just wanted to be like, sort of, I guess like friends, like whatever, you know, and, and we hang out and we, you know, spend a lot of time together and maybe sleep together, blah, 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 whatever. But like, that was, that was my experience. And this, this person was always telling me, this girl was always telling me when I would tell her, like, I'm like, I'm kind of, I wouldn't say I'm scared. I would say like, I don't really know how I feel. I'm not really sure. Like, I don't know. I just, I just want to tell you that like, I don't know about this. I just don't know. You know, it doesn't, I, I can't commit. I'm not, I'm not, but we would still be together. And like over time, like build, you know, stronger and stronger uh, feelings. And basically I, she would always tell me that I was afraid that I was afraid. And that I was like, uh, yeah, that I was coming from a place of fear and I never believed it. And in those moments, I felt like I was being manipulated. I thought like this, per this person wants to manipulate me. And like, you know, and, and can you, like, really someone who loved me, cared about me. I was like, this person wants to manipulate me. They just want to be like, be with me, whatever. Like this is what my, my ego or whatever was telling me. And it took 
months and months and months. And, and like, finally I ended up going, uh, going away and, and traveling and sort of, uh, cause it was kind of largely because of COVID that I was settled down in one place with enough time to sort of end up connecting with someone. And, and then I was away for many months and some still, still spent some time together, but only very sporadically over, uh, actually the beginning half of this year. And basically when things finally came to a head, it was when, you know, me thinking that I was the one who wasn't attached and basically went away. And then she finally told me like, and after some, some, um, just, yes, yeah, some time passed, but she told me that she had moved on, like, you know, just kind of one night on the phone. And I was also in a time where like, I was really mentally struggling. I had been going to these Joe Dispenza events, but I wasn't, you know, he talks about doing the work. Like, are you doing the work? Are you getting up and doing the meditation? Are you overcoming yourself when you feel those negative emotions come through? Or are you letting them guide you and drive your life, like steering the ship? And even though I was going to these events, I was still using it almost as like a, as a excuse to not do the work. I was like, I'm going to these events, yeah. but I didn't want to face it. Cause it's, 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 this is what I'm getting at. It's the thing you do not want to face. That is the thing you have to face. Cause that's what's between you and being happy or feeling the way you want to feel. So I was running, even using, again, can you imagine using the events as the excuse to not do the work? So I'd go, I would dabble my feet and dip my toes in for a week and say, Oh yeah, I'm going to the event. I'm going deep. And I would, I would, I would give it a genuine effort. But it doesn't just happen in a week, you know, or two weeks or three weeks. It takes consistent effort at understanding what's between you and happiness. Like you sit in the present moment and you say, I am whole. I am complete. To our earlier example, I am good. And anything the mind says that's between you and that is what needs to be overcome. You know, that's what I'm learning. It's really amazing. But like, and people say, oh, but I have to do this. I have to No, like from a perspective of the universe we are literally dust in the wind we're floating we're like our, our our lifetime is like the universe blinking its eye and closing in and opening it like so what are we so we know we know matter of factly from an even scientific perspective that our lives are such a, sh a short blink like we're all good like everything's fine the universe is cool with or without us in a certain respect right we're good. We're whole, you know, in a way, like we have the, the capacity to be whole, at least we're one with the universe. It's inter an interconnected dance. Why do we not feel that way? You know, and, and there's many theories. I think the matrix, the movie is the best explanation that's been ever documented yet. It's not a docu. It's not a, it's not a fiction movie. It's a documentary of exactly what's happening today. No exaggeration. I know like I'm laughing a little bit. No, I'm not exaggerating. I promise, brother, the matrix is a perfect example of oneness, unity, wholeness, enlightenment that the masters have touched living like children in heaven. That is the truth that we're born with and that we have the capacity to grow up in. And the matrix is the system of school is systematically teaching us to be incomplete, insufficient, not whole slaves, factory workers, so that someone in control of the system can basically harvest our life force energy, which is exactly what happens through the, in the matrix. This is why I'm saying it's not an exaggeration in the form of working in a job or a corporation, but it's not their fault. It's our fault for letting them do it to us. And the hard work is overcoming the the programming that we've we've allowed ourselves to be submitted to or that someone in past generations allowed us and the only person who has the ability to change it is me now in this moment not you not someone else me now in this moment that's it and in your world you now in this moment but that's it just me in this moment we can't change anyone but ourselves and so that's why i love these movies about the hero's journey harry potter this or that because it's the, it shows you that it's it's the evil isn't something you have to conquer outside of you. It's something you conquer with. I mean, Harry Potter never ever. I'm just watching it with my girlfriend now. Never has a better movie been made, in my opinion. Why? Because Harry Potter. If you're familiar with the series, and anyone who isn't should watch Harry Potter from start to finish. I promise you, change your life. Because when when Voldemort, oh, I shouldn't spoil this for people who haven't watched it. You know what? I think if most have, people have seen Harry. Yeah, Potter. you know what I'm gonna say. If you haven't watched Harry Potter, you need to skip and like. Skip until you're sure that you're not going to hear the spoiler. But in <laughs> Harry Potter, 
Basically, Lord Voldemort obviously kills Harry's parents, but the love that Harry's parents had for him, which is such a beautiful story, protects him from death. But in the process, Voldemort was creating these things they called horcruxes to expend, extend his lifespan. So he would have eight hor- seven horcruxes that would keep him alive throughout you know, even so someone couldn't kill him until they destroyed all of these seven horcruxes, which is what they hunt in the last two movies, the last one full movie, two parts. They hunt the horcruxes when you have to kill someone to create a horcrux. And so Harry Voldemort unknowingly created an eighth accidental horcrux in Harry Potter, a living horcrux when he killed Harry's parents. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing that kept Harry alive and basically almost killed Lord Voldemort. And so the idea is that the whole time Harry is having this inner battle of good and evil and he sees good, but he also sees the most evil tendencies in himself. And it's, it's the process of not, you know, Dumbledore, the wise headmaster has all these wise things to say, but he says something like, it's not, I don't even remember something super wise. He basically says like, it's not about, you know, the outer battle. It's about which one you choose. Like we all have good and evil in us. It's which one are you going to choose? And so Joe Dispenza will even make the remark like, I would wager that when you're in a meditation, it comes down to the buzzer and it's your time to overcome yourself. I would, he would say, I would say that in all of history and all of the universe, that moment is significant, you know? And that's kind of what we're talking about is that the moment that I react and judge the flight attendant or the moment that I choose that say I get off this podcast and I decide that I'm going to A, just go back into the pattern and or whatever pattern I might be in. And, and maybe if, if I'm not feeling great, by by default, maybe go into some stress or whatever, or B, I'm going to choose to break that pattern if I'm feeling that way, you know, and meditate and overcome myself and see the truth more clearly. So the reason I tell the story of the relationship was because finally, when this girl told me that she had moved on, like, dude, it ripped me apart. I mean, I, I had to face, but really I ripped myself apart. I had to face so much that I had been, I had taken this girl for granted. I had hurt her. I had not appreciated her humanity and love and care. And I took it all for granted. And like, you know, she felt that pain throughout and I, I felt it all at once. And that, you know, that was, I mean, it was weeks and weeks and weeks. It, it changed my, I'd shift my whole life direction and I was struggling in my business, like in certain ways. And again, mentally struggling because I've been blessed beyond measure by the universe, but like my own, incapacity, it seemed at the time to get over myself was, I was even sabotaging my own, in, in a way, sabotaging my own business, sabot- just my whole life. I was, cause when you have this negative energy, it, it, it affects everything, you know? And I had to get over myself and just decide to finally choose to be a different person. So I remember with that heartbreak kind of feeling, I, I went to the beach every day and was doing walking meditation after walking meditation, like Joe, with Joe Dispenza's recorded walking meditations that we do at the events. Uh, sitting was too difficult, although that's, that's the hard one. That's really good. But just trying to change my energy and overcome myself. But even then, it's easy to do a meditation, but not come up against myself and convince myself, oh, I did a meditation. I, I, that was good. No, you have to go so deep and feel that pain. But sometimes we're not ready. So sometimes you don't have to force it. But I'm careful when I say sometimes we're not ready. You don't have to force it. We don't want to force per se. But you know, I myself, and I imagine many people could say, oh, well, I don't want to force it. I'm not ready. Like if you're not ready now, when are you going to change? You know, that's the question is if you're not ready to be happy, you're not going to be happy. Like just back to the beginning when I was saying the the world we choose to live in, the world we choose to create now, that's the world we live in. That's the way we feel. Like, so if you're miserable and you're not willing to like sit, meditate and, and seriously evaluate, like probably you're blessed. And even if you're not like there's people like Victor Frankl or people who are poor, they still find things to be grateful for more than most of us in the Western world. Like, so probably you're pretty blessed, but why don't we feel it? Like, why don't we get rid of all the things between us and feeling the fact that we're blessed? And this is my work too. This isn't my new job. You know, I mean, yes, I do my business, but like really every day when I wake up, I realized, am I going to today, am I going to be stressed or am I going to be productive? Because the two are not mutually. And so I don't even work anymore if I'm stressed. I just won't do it because I'm going to sit my body down and say, listen, if I go and work and I'm stressed, I'm not being productive. I'm not advancing a mission in the world. I'm not advancing my purpose to be here. I'm not building raw optics. I'm 
projecting more of my own stress, fear, misery, suffering into my business. And that's only going to negatively affect anyone who it's related to, anyone who I'm, who, who I'm working with. It's just not good. So it's either, am I going to be productive today or am I going to be stressed and in, in the emotion? And that's really, that is the question every day now that I ask myself, like, <laughs> and I get to choose. It's just, I use those words because for me, it mentally clicks. I can say, Am I going to be stressed or am I going to be productive? And I, I just, because I want to be productive, obviously, but I know that I can't be stressed and productive because if I'm stressed, it means I'm falling prey. I can be excited, but stressed, it means I'm falling prey to some poor thinking and ingratitude. Yeah. <laughs> wow. We are living pretty similar paths in that regard because <laughs> the past, I would say like three months, um, you know, going off and on with, with the breakup, my productivity in business has been horrible because I wasn't doing what you said. I was stressed and I was still continuing to try to focus on my business. And obviously nothing productive was getting done. And then it finally basically came to the culmination yesterday, which was Sunday here. I took the whole day off. I planned to spend the whole day in nature, journaling, meditating. I took some mushrooms to enhance the experience and that was exactly what I needed. Like just that time in nature and being introspective, um, was, was perfect. And now I, and I'm not using this, like you can't just go do psychedelics once and like, everything's fine. Like this is a daily thing. Meditate every single day, journal every single day, which is something that I wasn't doing, even though I know that I should be doing those things. I wasn't doing those. And now after coming out of this experience, I now realize that, yes, these psychedelic journeys can be helpful, but it's not the answer. Like you have to do the work every single day. One of my friends that I had on my podcast uh, a while back, um, Matt Mans, he's uh, the circadian man on Instagram. So you guys would would get along well. Uh, I don't think this was his quote. It might be Jordan Peterson's, but it's clean the corners, which basically means like, do the work, go to that place that you don't want to go, look under the bed to find the monster, open your closet, see what's in there. You know, this is all figuratively speaking. Totally. But also in real life, like actually clean your room, make sure everything's neat and tidy because a cluttered room is a cluttered mind. Um, so go to that place, do the work, clean the corners. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's again, like great example, cluttered room. It's starting with an energy that's not uh, clear, grateful, productive. And then that it's, it's so above, so below, they say like, it's, it, that's the energy and that's what you see in real life, but it's, it's all the energy first. So you see a messy room. It's the person is in the belief that they don't have enough time. No, but this is the amazing thing. We have so much time in a day. Like I challenge anyone who thinks they don't have enough time. I everyone has a day off. When people yeah, say everyone that. has a day off though. Everyone has a day off. If you don't have enough time, I challenge you sit in a chair for the length of one full day from sunrise to sunset or even 12 hours, just sit in a chair for 12 hours straight and tell me you don't have enough time. It's, we have unlimited amounts of time. It, you would like, we would lose. I, I can't sit in a chair for 12 hours straight. No Lightning just flashed. It's, I mean, I could, okay. I shouldn't say I can't, it would be, it would be challenging because I'd have to yeah. come up against myself more and more and more. But the point is, we have so much time. It's not about not having enough time. It's are we in the present moment and moving in the energy of, of let's call it, as Dispenza says, the energy of our future, the person we want to be, or are we in the energy of, let's say, the past, as Dispenza calls it. In other words, are we choosing, when, when he says energy of the past and the future, I understand it to be a a way for, again, for people to pretend or to put on a, an outfit of, of one or the other. The past is all the, the known, the things we're familiar with, often the things we don't want to experience anymore, some of which, some we do, some we don't. Some we don't. The future is, is, represents unfettered, unlimited potential, anything we could want. But this is why you have to, this is why he has people, he brings it down to a really achievable, attainable level, like dream big, manifest your future, create whatever you want. Imagine anything you could create and know that that could be yours. And for many people, they just have to get over the belief that they're capable of, that they're they're worthy or that it's even possible for them to achieve certain things. Like I'm blessed on many levels. And, you know, in other words, like 
my spiritual path, my path in this life isn't about necessarily making money. You know, I'm young and I have a successful business. I'm earning an income. For many people, they think that if they could only just make a certain amount of money, they would be happy. I guarantee that's not it because I've experienced it. But people think that's it, but that's just not it. It's not. People think, oh, if I just like all these foreign countries, I have friends. Like I meet so many people in like places where I've like lived in Bosnia. And the number one thing people think about is money. They think if they made more money, they could have a better quality of life. But this is this is because it's interesting. That's a country that's really plagued by really bad government and really low down on the economic sphere. So they're all fully bought into the story that it's all about money, that if they could just make a little bit more money, but money, more money means nothing. I mean, $10 million in your bank account means nothing, nothing. It's literally innate information from outside. The meaning comes from, wow, what could I do with $10 million? What would I do with $10 million? And I can just tell the story, honestly. Like, so I started my business when I was 18 and uh, yeah, 18, just turned 18. And within not long, I had basically, I mean, I had to do a certain amount of work, but to, you know, to make it run, but basically almost like a four hour work week situation where like I had an income that could now allow me to travel wherever I want, do whatever I want, whenever I want, as long as I kept, you know, the business running and operating. And I didn't feel at all different at all. Like I had zero gratitude for the situation, which is why I didn't feel it. I wasn't grateful. I didn't, I didn't feel grateful for it. And maybe in certain levels, I was grateful if I'm being careful about the way I told the story, I tell the story, but I didn't feel it a lot of the time. And that's how I went so much into Dispenza because I wasn't feeling it. No matter how much more money my business made, I often felt less and less whole Mm -hmm. because I would always say, imagine that life is like we said earlier, a series of present moments. Well, whenever the present moment was existing, rather than saying, wow, like rather than my, the belief I'm holding in my mind in any given present moment being, wow, I'm so blessed. Like I'm young. I have a business that's bringing in income and I can basically do what I want to do. And I can, you know, I'm, I'm blessed. I have this opportunity and what am I going to do from this place of wholeness? You know, I'm whole, I'm blessed. I'm stoked. What am I going to do from here? Like my field, my energy field changes. You can see it when I talk like that versus like, Oh my gosh, like I can't, I can't handle the amount of work on my plate. It's so much. And I just, I'm choosing in that moment to be that stressed person. That's it. That's literally the difference because it's easier. It's easier. It's easier. It's more comfortable. It's what I knew, you know, but I spent years like that. So I never appreciated any amount of money. And the interesting thing too, is talk about energy guiding matter. I would, i I, like I said earlier about sabotaging my own business, I spent, I started spending so much money on different expenses in the business, on employees and this and that, that I actually took a great opportunity and almost cost myself the whole opportunity by not, by basically not being willing to step up to the plate. And it's not, this is the thing too. It's not like people think, oh, step up to the plate. You got to be a big, tough guy. You got to be strong and blah, 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 and fight. Like, no, stepping up to the plate is like, this is, this is opposite of what we think opening your heart, being vulnerable, being willing to be weird, being willing to be looked that funny, being willing to love people who hate you and judge you, who want to judge you, whatever. Like that's the true, the greatest man ever is the, the Jesus Christ or the master who loves no matter how much someone else hates, not the one who weighs 250 pounds of muscle and is jacked up and doing all the supplements. That's cool too, if that person loves, but like and everyone's a lot of times cool. that's, that's to, the thing. A lot of times they, at least from my experience, they go after that because they're lacking in what you were just mentioning. They they yeah. feel like there's something missing, and that they they're the gym is the escape for them, and they are suppressing what is is really inside. Now that might not be the case for everybody, right? Um, but yeah, I know at least for me, when I was, um, you know, a CrossFit coach and working out for four hours a day in Saudi Arabia, that was absolutely a, a part of the reason why I was doing it. You know, um, but I wanted to mention something of, that I'm reading in Sacred Economics. I'm very early on in it, but going back to what you said about the money, money <laughs> literally doesn't mean anything. It's what you do with it, but also you don't even need money to be happy you he in the book he talks about 
the like the gift gifting society giving and you can give if you don't have any money you can give love you can you know do things for other people and not in the hopes of getting anything in return but just giving without the intent of receiving and a lot of times that is what's going to make you happy and more often than not if you actually do give like out of a place of love and and don't hold back to give everything that you can you get a lot of things back in return because again gratitude is our default state so you do something for someone else they feel compelled to do something for you not that that's why you're doing it but if we can all get in that mindset of a less transactional society and more giving just for the sake of giving and and being good and loving I think I think the world will be a much better place. Yeah. Well, direction to go is when you say this, like you think you say, I think the world would be a much better place. I'm very careful too now about saying things like this because it creates like saying, I think the world would be a much better place. I get where you're coming from. And I'm sh- I know your intention is really good here. Um, it's as soon as we separate that, like the world being a good place and say, I think the world would be a much better place. Like, like it's not a good place now. Yeah. Well, in, 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 one, that's one, that's not exactly what I'm getting at. That is one, one thing worth considering, but yes, that does. Because within your world, let's just say for the purpose of, of example here within your world, by, as soon as you think the thought, ah, uh, if people would give, not that that's exactly what you're doing. I know that's not what you're doing, but just for example, cause we do this, I've done it. I do it, you know, even still like, Ah, uh, the world could be a better place if only people were more giving. Like, rather than saying, you know, there's a lot of really giving people in the world. The world is a pretty good place, and there's a lot of people who are really generous. Of course, there could be more, but like, then just starting from that base, the energy immediately is much better. Um, so, and the other example is like, you know, if if like Buddha said, be the change you wish to see in the world, because it's it's. I read. I remember reading that. Uh, one time, no, it was a quote from Buddha. That was Gandhi's quote. But the quote I read from the Buddha was, "In order to bring peace to the world, strive first to make your own life peaceful." I was, I had just gotten a massage in Bali, and it was hanging on the wall, and I'll never forget that. Like it stuck with me. Three years later, I remember that, like it was yesterday. It struck me so deeply because I was so stressed. And here I was thought I was trying to build a business to make the world better, this and that. And I wasn't willing to do whatever it was that I needed to do. I didn't even know what it was. I wasn't even looking for what I needed to do to make my own life more peaceful. I was just working, 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 grinding, trying to make more money. And so, you know, when you say like, well, let's just take that example. Like, let's, you know, if more people were more less, less transactional, more giving the world would be a better place. Like if you in your world were just so giving and you just were giving, 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 and you just saw only the giving in people, you know, none of the negative, only the love, that statement wouldn't even exist. It wouldn't even have a basis in reality. Right. And that, then that's your world. Like you can, you can create your world. And of course I imagine me, even this is the thing where it starts to get really a little trippy, but me saying what I'm about to say creates these people. This is the interesting thing for my world. But I was going to say, of course, there are the people who are going to maybe listen to this and maybe say, well, and because by me saying this, I'm giving people something to latch onto and identify as themselves. But I'll just say it for the purposes of demonstration here. So there may be people who hear this and say, oh, Matt, you're just you're just telling people to live not in the real world, in reality. You're just telling people to deny reality and pretend that the world's just la, 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 la. Everything's great. <laughs> but like, because I'm speaking to myself really, because that's what I may have thought if I heard myself talking about this, because I wanted to be miserable. I wanted to be addicted to suffering. And to that, I only have to say to that idea, is what is real? Just ask yourself, what is really real? What is real? You know, I, I, I've been going more and more back to this idea because Joe Dispenza, he, he gave so many ideas that resonated with so many things I was thinking since I was a kid. Like, I remember sometimes drifting off into states of like almost ecstasy of like, but not ecstasy, but like a super, almost like scary ecstasy and not the drug, but the state, the emotion, like feeling the sense of a deep awe, a deep, deep, deep awe, indescribable awe at the question, 
who are we, where are we, what are we? And looking like imagining that the earth, let's just take what scientists say for granted as if it's all true, which I don't know for sure, but let's just say it is. We're on earth. There's the sun. We're in the solar system. It's in the Milky Way galaxy. It's one of many, many galaxies out there. One's of one of billions of galaxies in this universe, meaning one, you know, world universe. And maybe there's more, maybe there aren't. We don't know. I don't know if they know if they're still figuring it out or not. But basically the point is like what I was, what I would kind of geek out at in a way as a kid was like, okay. And then what, you know, like, and then what, okay, there's, okay, there's the universe. And then what, okay. Somebody tell me what else there's, is this, where are we? Hello. And then like the end product of that whole thinking process was like me wanting to like, in a way, metaphorically speaking, shout like, hello, hello, hello. Is there anybody out there? Where are we? Is it just us? You know, like, and, and really it's like, where are, it's really unusual. Like, you know, okay. People talk about ET and extraterrestrial and other forms of life. Maybe, maybe not. But like, even if there are other forms of life, like within what context is that all occurring? You know, it's a super unusual question, which if one really takes a moment to like really sit with it, it's, it's like breathtaking. It's absolutely awe inspiring and terrifying is the best word I can think of. Actually, it's pretty scary. But for me, it represents ultimate freedom because when you realize you have nothing to lose, you have everything to gain, you know? And that's why when people say, when I, I say, what is real? Because like, really, you know, what's real is, is if you're miserable and you want to be miserable, that's your real. But if I'm in heaven on earth and I'm the God who's here to save the world now, I'm not saying that's exactly what I think right now. Some people might think you're arrogant, but the other, the best response to that is so what, you know, I think so what? That the, the happiest people, maybe a lot of the time, are the ones who just literally stopped caring what anyone else thought about them. You know, I, I sometimes tell myself, I, I don't care what people think about me. Totally not true. I totally think what people care about me because sometimes if I fully surrendered more and was truly myself, I'm, my, I notice thoughts like, oh, they're going to judge me. They're th- going to think I'm crazy. Oh, they're going to cut the podcast interview off in the middle because I'm just talking and they don't like what I'm saying. Like things like that. Those are just thoughts that go through the head. So, what's real? You know, why don't we, with that knowledge, then we can create real. So I can even see myself just to be honest, I spent like probably 90% of today up until this podcast, like actually my mind was going crazy. And, in, and just beyond being honest, instead of sitting down and saying, no, I'm going to cut that off and see what this emotion is, even if it's going to hurt and be painful. I chose that. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to go do all the other things to distract myself. Going for a walk is cool and going for a walk is always great. But for me, like, again, being careful with what I create to be my reality, sometimes the best thing to do is sit and meditate. Also though, you know, and and going for a walk isn't enough internal evaluation, right? Going for a walk, even if it's a quiet walk or listening to an audio book, sometimes just cutting all the senses off and just going inward and noticing the the, the, the swords and the cannons going off and everything that's happening in there and just kind of like letting it all calm down and say like, what, what am I worried about again? Every the con in the context of what I just shared, everything's okay. My life's like the blink of an eye. Why am I not just like super stoked and doing something really fun right now? Like, why not? You know? And, and then of course people talk about their jobs and they have to go to work. That's something people have to free themselves from. If I promise if an 18, 17 year old who has basically no real world experience can do it. I guarantee anyone can do it. I'm so grateful. I can say that. Like I could do it. Anyone can do it. I'm sure, you know, it's not that difficult. It's just, are you willing to face the pain and the struggle and the suffering? And people tell me you're awfully wise for a 22 year old. It's like, I am wise to the extent which I have experienced and, and maybe willingly or unwillingly moved through pain. Maybe it took me years to learn the lesson, or maybe it took me an hour to learn the lesson, but I'm, I've, I've gone through and I've, I've on many levels chosen to learn the lessons. I think that's what's holding a lot of people back. Is their aversion to first be by themselves and sit with their own thoughts? I think a lot of people are scared of what they're going to find. And then that then manifests would itself. Be. <laughs> Into, I might be too. <laughs> right, of course. But on the other side of that is where the bliss is. And then this manifests itself if people stay in their nine to five job that they don't like for 50 years expecting to retire happy. That's not the case. 
right? First, mm. you have to conquer Amen. your inner demons. You have to conquer yourself and be comfortable with yourself. One of the, the realizations that came to me yesterday while I was on my introspective journey was that I am okay being with myself and just being alone by myself. And I, after the, this breakup, I felt a feeling of loneliness that I was alone. And that was a, a really big struggle. And then yesterday I realized I'm not lonely. I even like, I'm, I'm fine just being with myself, my Amen. own thoughts. I'm, I love that. And once I came to that realization, it was like whew, a Amen, weight was lifted man. off my shoulders. That's, that's the freedom. And that's, and you chose to do that. You chose to be free. You could have said, you could have said, I'm miserable. I hate that girl. She was whatever, like I'm and self pity self, but you made the conscious choice to be different and to, to what you just told me. Beautiful. Like, and that's, I remember doing that as a kid too. I'd go to part, like I'd be young in high school. And I, I remembered nights when I was just sad or depressed. I don't know why, maybe something happened, but I was just using whatever happened as an excuse to reinforce my own depression. Mm -hmm. Like it wasn't about the event. It was just about me as it always is about us. It's always about us, you know, like not in a, in a negative sense. I'm saying like, it's, it's always about us and how we're going to be in the world. And so uh, I, I remember there were some nights where I would just decide, you know what, I'm just going to get over myself and go out and be with my friends. And maybe I would shed a tear and kind of worry like, what, like that sunk cost fallacy with poker. Like, why was I just investing all my energy in stress and fear and pain? Like, it was like hard to, it, to forgive myself. And that's the other thing we have to like forgive ourselves. I think acceptance and forgiveness are the keys to whatever it is that you're looking for. You have to first accept what happened and then forgive either yourself or whoever you believe caused that to you. But we now know that it's yourself that is, is manifesting these. Yeah. That's the path of the master for sure. Yeah. It's never anyone else. It's always us. <laughs> no. Um, okay. So let's, you know, uh, there was something you just said, which was about people retiring. I like, this is another great thing. We just, tackle everything as it comes. Like this is the way to do a podcast in my IMO, in my opinion. So you said people want to save and retire. I learned for sure from firsthand experience that, cause I thought with my, I thought this was the, the mindset I was believing in. Where did it come from? I don't know. School. I, I, have, I have no idea. It came from somewhere and it was there. And many people may be able to really relate to it is the idea that happiness, that I couldn't be happy until something. I couldn't be happy. Really, really hear this one, people. My homies, everyone listen to this. I love you. <laughs> but like it was the idea that I couldn't be happy until, I don't know, until like say I'm, I'm, I'm recording a podcast. I'm doing something. I'm, I'm yep. working. I can't be happy until this is over till I go sit and meditate. That's also me telling myself the illusion. Like if I'm, the truth is that we can do this change of, of energy in any moment. I can do it right now. I can choose to be free. It's just, it's just a choice. But if I say, in fact, meditation can even be used, it's all about the energy. Like I keep repeating myself here, which is important. I need to do it for myself too, to repeat myself. Like that I could say, I'm not, I'm not going to be happy until I sit and meditate. And then I'm just perpetuating the unhappiness. If I, the true master, just if they notice the funk, they just change it. They say, you know what? And you have to feel the pain. Like, wow, I spent... For example, you could say, I spent the whole day or a whole week or even harder, maybe a whole year or 10 years being a miserable person. And I, I, it, I never had to do that. I never, ever had to, never once did I have to actually do that. I chose that. Mm -hmm. I chose that. But imagine the freedom and the bliss on the other side of that. Oh my gosh, you're free. You know, and it was worth, that's the best part. It was worth the 50, 60 years because the amount of wisdom you take from that experience, you can die. This is the best line in any song I ever heard. It's Billy Joel's song called Vienna. And he says, but you know that when the truth is told that you can get what you want or you can just get old. And mm -hmm. it's like, you can get what you want or you can just grow old. That's basically it. Like you just get old or you can have everything. You know, wow. it's true. Do you see the lightning just yeah, flash? That was, cool, was that? That was cool. That was really badass. Yeah. So um, really interesting. And see, that's God saying that was something really important.
Mm. I, I, I don't, I, I, you know, it's, it's more fun to think that things have a meaning. I don't Absolutely. know if it does or doesn't, but the lightning flash, as soon as I said the quote and it was beautiful and it lit me up. So there's something there. Anyway, the, these things start to happen and you, you get like, I just notice all these synchronicities and I'm like, Hmm. In fact, you know, it was crazy. So the other day too, like my girlfriend was, uh, as new relationships, maybe naturally do like sort of challenging something I was sharing, like kind of questioning, like, are you really here for me? Are you really just, is it just Mm -hmm. a cool idea for you or something? And like, it was like a mind based question about love, which later we realized like it was an not unfair, but it was an unanswerable question, even though I was trying to use my mind to answer it because that was the vein in which it came from. And I just couldn't, no matter what it was like, there's no way where I could like use my words to express like love and devotion, you know? Um, that, that really mattered, you know? And cause that's, again, like you create the separation, you ask the question that doesn't have a real basis and you get the answer that doesn't have a real basis in reality, like the energy. So above, you know, so below as above, so below. And so in the moment though, like I said something and I've never experienced this in my life. It was, it sounded like an electric sound of a helicopter, some kind of holographic. It was like a massive flock of birds, like flying around and it, it was like, it was like a solar eclipse. Like th- they flew in front of the sun and the whole, it was like black just for a moment. And it was like, it was like the birds were like a, like a bee, a swarm of bees, you know, the way they kind of fly together. And it's like this, but I never saw it with birds. It was huge. And it was unbelievable. Like you see flocks of birds, but this was like, they were a school of fish. Like they were I'd never mm. seen anything in my life. It was unbelievable. And it was like another kind of synchronicity. And, you know, we could choose, oh, it was just random. Or we'd be like, oh, there was meaning there. Maybe there was a meaning. Uh, So about the people growing old, my own experience was that when I said, okay, like I bought into this idea that I'm going to build up my business and get it cranking and humming. And this was exactly what I told myself for like four years, literally my experience for four years, which for me is, you know, like a third of my memorable life basically. So or like, it just feels like a long time for me. It feels like forever, you know? And, but, but at the same time, because time is all relative, it was like the blink of an eye. Like I remember before that four years as if it was yesterday also. So it's all this kind of just a construct, which is all the more reason in my opinion is to not put so much weight on the whole thing. Yeah. But so, you know, and just take it for granted, take it not for granted, but take it for what it is um, something really not for granted, but like actually evaluate it. And, but don't take it too heavy either. Right. That's like the middle way. It's like, don't, don't take it like it's meaningless, but don't take it like it's too serious either. Like it can be both. It's not meaningless. It can be both like very unusual, obscure and uncertain, but also have some meaning in that that meaning is like Jordan Peterson talks about like, and, and Joe Dispenza, like there is a, a meaning, there is something, there is something beautiful. That is why we're here. In fact, like we were getting at, I was getting at earlier, like, It's not just, oh, it's a little bit of meaning. It's like my life is all the meaning in the universe as far as I'm concerned. It's all I have. It's the only thing I can exert any influence over. So why not take it seriously? Because if I choose to be one of the people who says it doesn't matter, then I'm no better than the guy in the Nazi concentration camp who's murdering innocent people. Truly, when I say life doesn't matter, that's what it, I mean, really, maybe that's an extreme example. I don't think so, though. You have to really believe that life doesn't matter to not be one of the very, very few who stands up like the uh, Schindler's list, you know, Schindler who stood up and saved lives. Cause he, he, he believed that there was a meaning that in what he was doing that was worth going against the trends. And in fact, this is where it starts to get really interesting. Is it possible that in the same way that the collective unconscious that was occurring in Nazi Germany to allow Nazi Germany to occur the way that it was doing. And no one even knew it. No one even really was willing to wake up from it. It was just accepted. Is it possible that it matters just as much today that we wake up like really, and I'm not, this is not an exaggeration that things are happening in the world right now. And I'm not necessarily referring to COVID, not necessarily, it could be, or it could not be, it could be anything, even before COVID, if I ask this question, it would still be valid. Is it possible that it is just as important, if not more important in light of having learned the lessons from Nazi Germany, that each of us choose to stand up and fight against evil? Because what one of the best lessons that came to me in addition from this uh, becoming aware that I was wanting to be sad, I remember I was asking myself at this last Joe Dispenza event, which for me is just a, a deep dive, you know? 
I was asking myself, like, why I was looking for a meaning, some purpose, right? Something that I could be like, this is important for me. Something that just like when I was younger, I remember when I was 17 and I started the business, which is what I was getting into earlier. I'll leave that one on the side right now. But I was getting into business and something was inspiring me. Something was motivating me. There was something I wanted to learn about that seemed like it mattered. You know, it, it felt important. The books about EMF and the lawyers who tried to protect us all from EMFs and basically the government and the committees, and they all kind of shat on this guy and hit his work. And now everyone has EMFs. It was like this. I was like, I felt like there was evil in the world and that I could do something to alleviate it. And that was what was like inspiring me and filling me with life and purpose when I woke up every day. It wasn't just like my life was meaningless. It was like I was one of the characters in the films that I earlier said that inspired me, right? And then I went into a period of like feeling like I was losing that meaning. Like I was just on a daily day-to-day -day treadmill and I didn't really feel the meaning anymore. Well, what changed? Was it the situation or was it just me that lost that? It was just me. Mm -hmm. And it, it goes further. I also was justifying my lack of meaning by kind of coming to believe that life was actually in some respects meaningless. I was actually like losing the sense of, of, of purpose. It just, I wasn't feeling it at certain times. It didn't have some, I didn't feel like there was a, I didn't see a light in the future. Basically. I didn't see something that made sense to me. Largely I learned I was not largely because, but at one point I came to believe that I came to believe that the only person I could really control was myself. And so I was, I was both holding this idea. Well, okay. At one time I wanted to change the world and fight evil, but then at one point I learned, wait, no, but the only, the only person I can control is myself. And I, I didn't really say how it clicked together. And it, in one moment, it just became so clear that based on this new information I was learning, it's none of the evils outside. It's all within me. It's all because that's, that's what I'm saying, right? You, someone challenges me, takes me to my logical endpoint. There is no evil in the world, but that that lives within me as far as I'm concerned, right? And so I have to extinguish all of the evil within myself. And that is all of the evil in the world. That is it. And that's all I can do. And some people say, no, you're speaking in hyperbole. You're exaggerating. I'm really not exaggerating. That's the purpose of, of this. This is why when Jesus would speak, it's like paradoxes. It's like, doesn't make sense. You have to really look in. And it, it, it is true. The own, based on all the stuff I'm sharing, the only evil that I can affect is the evil within me. Even if there is evil outside of me, I have zero effect over it. So as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't exist. I can only overcome the evil within myself that would be a coward in some challenging situation that would back down, that wouldn't sacrifice my life in when it came down to it. You know, those are, that would, that wouldn't be willing to even die or experience torture for the truth, you know? That's what I have to overcome in this life. And so that started to give me a different, whole different sense of meaning, harder and scarier for sure. But like now when I get up in the day, it's like, I have something that really does matter. And it's just a matter, am I going to remember that it matters or not, that I get to overcome myself, I get to overcome evil in my own life. I think that... <clears throat> Yes, obviously, the only evil that we can control is within ourselves. But I believe that we can influence other people, right? By you first working on yourself, like you, you can't pour from an empty cup, right? So you fill yourself up first. And then with all this overflowing love and gratitude and giving, you can then pour onto other people. And then they can hopefully take that and that inspires them to do the same. Yeah, that's essentially what I'm saying. That's, okay. you know, if you, if you evaluate the, from a, I guess I could say materialist or 3D uh, perspective, because, you know, I, I understand you want to make this comprehensible for a listener. Like if you take that perspective, yes, that's what resultant you could see. Imagine any great master or Jesus, you know, they overcome all the evil within themselves yeah. and you, and, and they ultimately pour onto many. And so it was like, I wanted to help people, but my cup was empty. It's like, I really should mm. ought to like, how can I help if I'm miserable? What can I really help someone? Like, okay, maybe I can help someone with their work. Maybe I can help lift buckets or chop, but like yeah. people don't want just food. Yes. People want food. I get just to be clear. People want food, but people want to be happy. They want to be filled, you know, with love. And that's where people need the most help in the world today. You know, it, okay. There are people starving in Africa, but different conversation. Yeah. 
aid from our governments and foreign governments has clearly been determined to be only subversive to their best intentions. So it's completely separate conversation, but we need to first stop enforcing the governments that are keeping these people enslaved, Yeah, but and supporting them, but different uh, politics, you know, again, different could, yeah, a whole other podcast. Not, not a spiritual <laughs> per se conversation, although everything's really spiritual at its essence, but the, what the, the people who I have the capacity to really help the most or the people that we have the capacity to interact with and impact in our daily lives, the people we see, the people we meet on the street, I'm in Europe, you know, I'm in America mostly like, and even when I'm in Costa Rica in Central America, like the people who I see, they don't, they have food mostly, you know, I'm not in Africa, you know, I'd love to also be able to, you know, grow my business more and more and maybe take cash and, and invest in, in poor communities and, and really help people get their own, you know, get started and, and, and so on. This is why I'm a huge fan of Bitcoin too, because it usurps the power of governments and and yep. uh, thieves, basically thieves, a mm-hmm. disguised as politicians. And so um, anyway, that's a very interesting conversation. We could also get into if we want the nature of how Bitcoin is spiritual, because if we talk about this matrix system, basically soft money, as they call it, for fiat currencies and regular government currencies, can be easily manipulated. Like there's a quote in a book I was recently reading that the King of England in 1604, I think it was like the, the parliament basically passed a law saying that the King can basically increase the value or devalue his own currency as he wishes and even eradicate all of its value, which basically means if money is what people are using, you know, we're using to represent the value or the government is basically giving people no option, but to use their currency as a representation of the work that they do in their life and accumulate it and earn it. And the king in that case, which is the same power the Fed still has today, could just literally debase the currency as much as it wants. It's basically saying, we don't give a a damn about you. We don't care about you at all. You could work you know, your entire life and save money and we'll cut the value of it in half because inflation is literally just theft from people. By inflating the money, they're just basically stealing and taking a profit on having people holding their work in their currency. So it's, it's the biggest theft ever. And obviously, I mean, you, you're shaking your head and stoked to see him. So Bitcoin That's eliminates what's happening, yeah. this, the hard money eliminates it. I only started learning about this recently, but for me, because I'm here talking with you about energy and about the matrix and how the governments are usurping and stealing people's energy, like, okay, yes, it's our fault for allowing it to happen. Like the, the government, the people at the top, they're not the responsible ones, actually. People always want, and I did too. I always wanted to blame the people at the top, always. And that that's was easier. Thing. It's way easier. Yes, it's so much easier to blame people, but that's not saying I'm going to take the responsibility on myself and own up to where I fell short and I was unconscious and own up to it so thoroughly. And over time, the people who do that, but without attachment, but only with love and care, like the Nelson Mandela's, and they stand for that cause no matter what, even if it doesn't change the world in that lifetime, you know, while they're alive, it almost always works. The person who's willing to die. I mean, that's why martyrdom is martyrdom, like the dying for a cause mm-hmm. is so impactful because people, when someone dies, because they believe in something so strongly, people look, they're like, whoa, that dude cared more about this idea than about his life. In fact, someone told me a story recently of a guy who was burned at the stake in, I don't even know, Italy or some, some, some country. No, 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 no. Long ago. Okay. But I don't remember the situation, but someone listening to this, I'm sure will know the situation. But as he was burning, they, he said to them, just know that I'm not afraid of you guys that yeah, you're more Mm -hmm. afraid of the ideas in my head than I am of you. Can you imagine someone saying that as they're being burned at the stake? You're more afraid of me and my ideas than I am of you. That makes him scared even more. Wow. Yeah, right. So, (laughs) yeah, exactly. Like this guy, like we we can't control these. So all all of this to say is, you know, Bitcoin and all this stuff, like it's the same message. Let's and maybe we could get even even just practical applications, you know, as as I don't know if how we are in time, but please. Yeah. Let's let's give some practical app. So practical applications right now for people to really consider based on this and the, you know, we brought up the quantum field report and everything about that's sort of where this all came from is that we can, my, my example is perfect. I've given, I've said kind of repeated this a few times, but it's like, as someone who knows this information and knows that I can choose to sit meditate, maybe put it on a blindfold, maybe not, whatever. Meditation is just one way to do this, but it's, it's my preferred way because it's, it's what I know. 
sit, close my eyes. Any, I think in my mind, like a cave, right? And it's like a dark cave and it's, there's, it's oneness and wholeness and everything's complete. And as soon as I notice a thought or a stress, any emotion, stimulus, awareness of time, any of these things, these concepts, these are things Dr. Dispenza talks about. Again, big sales pitch, big shout out, go to him and, and learn from his courses and events and so on, just so, so he gets credit for the way he's broken this down beautifully. But basically any of these uh, awarenesses, these things that basically distract us, these are the things that are intruding on my dark cave, right? And I don't want that to happen. I don't want that to be the case. And so basically what I do is I just become aware of them and let them go. And if it's something that won't go away, I know this is the thing I need to get over. So, you know, just giving it like just kind of, it's hard to describe. You just kind of have to be with it but either becoming aware that that's not true or that's not the be all end all, or that's just not it, that distraction or whatever's coming in, or even if it is true, just that that doesn't have to be the thing I'm giving my attention to right now. I can just be giving my attention to this sense of unity or oneness or nothing as Dr. Joe describes. And so just slowing the brainwaves down, this is how we slow our brainwaves down and we reach into our subconscious mind. And that's when, especially now we can do this any time of day, we can choose to change our mind, change our perspective, but this is a way that to have to do it at a really deep level to really feel it and, and change our feeling, you know? Um, so what I will notice happen, and it's just, I can sometimes feel when some emotion or some, like, I'm going to probably go meditate after this podcast or this evening before bed and like, just be aware if there's some dis-ease, you know, I'm starting to use the term, not disease, yeah. but dis-ease. And people have done this before. It's not my idea, but it's like, I, I didn't understand when people did it either. It's anything that keeps us from being in a state of perfect ease. You know, you're at ease, you're one, you're whole, you're good. As we said earlier, anything that, you know, you say I'm good. Anything that feels like, but this, but this, but I have to do that. But I, just becoming aware of all the stories we're telling us. It doesn't mean we can't do those things, but just becoming aware that they don't have to keep us unhappy. We don't have to keep attaching to them. And then usually for me, if I'm willing to go there, quote unquote, go into the, the, the thing that is the boundary, the border, the edge of where I think I create my reality or, you know, the problem that seems insurmountable, you know, maybe something in my business, for example, in this moment, just it's kind of the same thing I've told myself for so long, which means I just need to keep going after it is this idea that like somehow I just can't manage everything. It's just so much. There's so much to do. Um, you know, it's just like and I, I let that idea drain energy from the present moment because what I could be doing, I could be if I was in the present moment, just doing the next activity, doing the next activity, doing. And then I can look, I even look back and say, wow, I just got a lot done or sit there for hours saying, oh, I'm never going to be able to get this done, you know, get this all figured out. And that's the, the, the secret of the people who are in the present moment. Like I said, sit in the chair for 12 hours and see that you have a lot of time. They're literally just in the present moment. They're not draining and siphoning their energy out into the past or into some anxiety or worries about the future. They're just, what's the next step? What's the next step? Okay, maybe the next step is to sit and evaluate and think and plan, but it's not, it's not ceaselessly worrying and infecting everything they do. It's very intentional, sit down, targeted, plan, focus, back, you know, and that's the present moment and the present moment continues. So that to me is like the best practical takeaway that people can do. But, you know, Jesus and all these other masters talk about it. Like it's, it's difficult and that's why it's so rewarding choosing to forgive that person, choosing to love. You know, I have a great story too. One time I sold even new years ago, I was at a store and I bought a beach chair and a little umbrella from this beach store in Malibu where I was living at the time. And I went to the beach and I used the umbrella and the umbrella was kind of one of the little cheaper quality one. And like the bottom point on the umbrella, the little plastic piece that makes it so you can dig it and circle it and spiral it to go deep into the sand. It came out when I was digging into the sand. So that was one thing that annoyed me. Secondly, the chair like was just such a design that when I sat on it, my butt was on the sand. It was like a weird design, but that's just how the chair was. It wasn't meant to elevate you. So I went to the store. I was very unconscious, just to be clear, very ungrateful. I went to the store and gave the guy, I was so mean to him about his crappy products and how the chair was a piece of crap, even though that was the design of the chair. It had nothing to do with him. 
I felt so bad. And I knew even not being aware of the spiritual, I felt so bad. I knew what I did was wrong. I went back to the store two or three days later and literally hoping the guy was there and had my head down and I was sad because I knew I made a mistake, but at least I was leading with my heart. And I went and I said, sorry to the guy. I'm like, I'm sorry. I was so unkind. And like, the guy was like astounded. He's like, he was so grateful and thought it was such a nice thing I did that he literally like said, like, take a soda, like anything you want, like, just take one. Like, but that's the perfect example. Like it feels like pain. It feels like you're going to die, but it's that moment. Everyone's felt it at least once. Like when you, you feel free and you can finally surrender, like, what was I worrying about? Gosh, all the while, this beautiful situation unfolding around me and my sister and my brother and my parents and the bitterness, I finally decided to let go of it and be free. And gosh, and then like the work problem that was happening, it doesn't even feel like a problem anymore. Like it's just going deep to what's really stressing us out, you know, and, and, and letting go and surrendering. And that's, that's kind of the path, you know, that's what I'm learning now. Yeah, it, it really is a great feeling. Uh, and I hope if you've made it this far into this almost two and a half hour long podcast that I'm sure they have, <laughs> that you, you don't just hear what he's saying, but you actually listen, because I think that's two, those Hallelujah. are two different things. You can hear somebody and like with me and my ex-girlfriend, for example, I would hear the words that she was saying, but I wasn't listening, right? Amen, I didn't actually, I didn't actually comprehend what was going on or actually think about it. So please listen to everything that, that Matt has been saying. And now to wrap it up, let's actually talk about your business, Raw Optics, and, Thanks, and, why, yeah, so... <laughs> and why you're sitting in darkness right now. Yeah, exactly. And a red light is shining on my face. So yep. basically, I started Raw Optics. Um, throughout this journey, I mentioned that I went to a point where I learned that light was important for health. And so even though we've spent this, you know, in, in entirety of this podcast discussing mental thinking, because this for me is the most interesting thing right now. Ultimately, the belief that underpinned myself as a kid and underpinned even the creation of my business and all this stuff is this idea that we are greater than we think, more powerful than we can imagine, and more unlimited than we could ever dream, in the words of Dr. Dispenza. And it's really true, right? And so in the process, the one of the stages for me was this discovery that it wasn't all just about diet and food, right? So like most people, as I see it, are, are focused on food and how to change their life using diets, which is where I was about seven years ago as well. And I understand why, because it's appealing, it seems simple, and it seems like, wow, you change your diet, you're healed. But it's really not that simple. Uh, it can have huge health benefits and it's important to eat actually a healthy diet. Of course, it's important. You don't want to be putting junk in your system, right? But light, it turns out, is even deeper because light is what controls our body's circadian rhythm, the biological clock that controls our metabolism, our hormones, our health. And so the light that we get, especially sunlight, is super beneficial. Now, artificial light at night can be disruptive. So I have a computer screen, so I have a bright uh, and the sun basically just set here. So it's been getting darker and darker, but the, I have a filter on my screen actually that basically blocks and let's see if I have use it. Iris. Yeah, I use Iris. It's a really, Iris is a really amazing software that allows us to block light on our computer from, uh, from the blue range here. Let me get these glasses mm -hmm. right here. Yeah, for everybody listening, uh, I have Iris as well. And I recommend everybody install Iris. It's like, I don't know, it's super cheap, maybe like $5 or something. And I've got a discount where you can get like a dollar off. <laughs> Ridiculous that you should even need a discount for that. But uh, you can switch it from health mode, which is what I use during the day, which blocks some of the blue light. And then in the evening, switch it to sleep mode and your, your screen is completely red. Exactly. And so that's what I have on my screen. And so that's that's really what I was learning. It's a really very important thing. And like, if anyone's interested, go listen to any other podcasts I've done, basically, because the entirety of those are usually speaking about this stuff. But I was interested, like, this is also a result of me changing my energy. I was like, you know what? I'm getting bored of talking about the same thing. I've talked about it a million times. If anyone wants to hear me say the same thing, go listen. It's pretty interesting too, in my opinion. I really yeah. like it. And that's, I wouldn't have talked about it if I didn't find it interesting. But um, you know, I, I also thought it was the be all end all. And it does go a level deeper because if you're chronically in emotional stress, you're not still going to heal even if your light environment is all dialed in. But anyway, it still has a huge impact, a level deeper than food. Because just the example of the car analogy for people yeah. to understand, if you have a car engine and the engine is broken, the spark plugs are worn out, you could be putting in premium gas and it wouldn't 
necessarily, the car wouldn't run. It wouldn't run correctly. In the same way, if our cellular engines, the mitochondria are not working the way they're designed, they're not working optimally, we could be putting in premium food, just like premium fuel. It doesn't fix the broken engine. The engine, and, and how do I know the engines are broken? Well, because there's a researcher named Dr. Douglas Wallace from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, who's been doing research for years and years. And all of the, the studies and the, the majority of scientists and the hundreds of hundreds of millions of dollars, even billions of dollars spent on research for trying to understand the causes of disease in genetics have failed. They're not in the genes. The diseases are in our mitochondria. This is basically the places that create energy. And it makes sense when you think, well, if you have a system that requires energy to function well, you reduce the amount of energy it can produce, you damage the engines, you can't make enough energy to carry out the functions that require the energy, and therefore you have disease, you have problems in these systems. And the thing is that food is just the fuel going into the engines, into the mitochondria. It doesn't, isn't the main thing that controls them, although it has an impact. Light is actually one of the main things that controls the mitochondria, because again, it controls our circadian rhythm, our sleep wake cycle, sunlight during the day powers our mitochondria and makes them healthier. And then artificial light at night disrupts our body's production of melatonin, which is the most important molecule for repairing the mitochondria, making them healthier, making them function the way they're designed to making them optimized and repairing all the oxidative damage that is accrued during the day in the process of energy production while we're living our daily life, eating food and burning it with oxygen to make energy. And so that's what melatonin fixes. When we don't have protection from blue light at night, or just to put it simply, when we have blue light exposure at night from a screen without iris software or a TV where you can't put iris software or a light bulb or a street light or a car headlight, it disrupts melatonin. It disrupts our body's circadian rhythm. So we're, we're going to sleep in later, wake up later, miss the sunrise, which also furthers the disruption, but we're going to lower our sleep quality. We're going to have problems falling asleep because we're not going to get as tired because melatonin darkness so basically darkness is just like I was talking about energy, so above, so below in all these examples. It's the same with our environment. Darkness is sort of an energy, so to speak. And in us, melatonin is the hormone that basically codifies and represents darkness within us. So when it's dark, the brain starts making melatonin. We relax and we sleep and we sleep well and we wake up and we have more energy. And the better, the darker the darkness at night and the lighter the light during the day, the stronger our circadian rhythm is and the better our entire biology really functions. So I started Raw Optics. The reason why was because one, I wanted to have a business that I could do something good and provide something useful. Two, you know, to be honest, out of some personal interest and necessity, graduating high school, I also wanted to be able to be free and travel and explore and further this mission and be able to bring this podcast to people. So this podcast is literally made possible by me having a, this business and you know, all my research is actually made possible through this business and all this learning that I can share. So this is another reason if you find it interesting, you should just go check this out. But because again, so above, so below, if you believe in me and what I'm sharing with you, well then- I think you'll find it interesting. The other benefits I have to offer you, actually, they'll more than interesting. People can imagine. You have the glasses. Have you used them? Oh, yeah. Experience? Oh, yeah. Okay. That was my first pair of blue light blockers. They've been amazing. amazing. So thank you. Well, so we can touch on that briefly, but basically, or as much as you want, really, but um, essentially- So the science is down. This is why when we wear the glasses, they block the light that- disrupts our body's circadian rhythm. So you wear the sleep lenses, as we call them. Previously, I called them night lenses, but sleep lenses is more specific. You put them on when the sun sets and they block any blue light sources. So anytime you're exposed to any lights, what, any screen that doesn't have the iris software, or even when it does have iris software, I'll still wear my glasses like right now, mm -hmm. because there's still some blue light that makes it through the software, through the backlight, um, from the backlight of the computer, any lights, any place, Anywhere I go, I wear my sleep lenses. Now, in the houses where I stay, because I'm traveling a lot, I usually just use little red light bulbs or a little red light headlamp that you can get on Amazon for 15 bucks. Yep. Uh, that's about it. Or candles. Candles are the best thing to do in your house or just like red light bulbs. You I can like get salt on Amazon. lamps. Himalayan salt, salt lamps. lamps are great too. Great energy. So these are all great things. But anytime you go out or you have a family you have to deal with, like I use, even, even as someone who, who knows about this and can control my environment, I still wear these sleep lenses effectively every night. Mm -hmm. So they're very, very impactful. And the main thing for people to know is that 
they calm you down so much. Like if you're watching TV, everyone I sit with who watches TV, they say, I literally can't imagine not having these. Like I can't imagine not like not watching TV with these like friends who lose them. They literally email me or like text me like, dude, like no one uses it. No, I'm just kidding. No one uses email for <laughs> friends. Like they text me like, dude, like I need more pairs. Like, please hook me up. Like I lost my glasses, like stat, you know? And they're, if they're like overseas, they're like, no, like <laughs> it's miserable. It's like a drug, but it's a healthy drug. Cause it's just, it's just reconnecting us with nature. My goal was not to create something new or complicated. It's to tell people first, the truth, heal your mind, get sunlight, get darkness at night. You're good. The products help to alleviate the disconnects we've created in the modern world. Uh, we also offer, so that's sleep lenses. We also oh, offer screen lenses. R- r- real quick on this, yeah, the sleep no, no lenses. Work. This is one of the one of the investments that I just think is a no brainer, right? This is something that you buy once and you wear it every single day, and it makes you healthier. Like it's just a, a freaking no brainer to to, I agree. to invest in in blue light blocking glasses, like. Thank you, brother. I, I fully agree. It's a really, it's a really huge, huge thing um, that, that has a simple impact. And the other thing too, is like most of the blue light blocking glasses on the market are either clear lenses, which yeah. to put simply clear means that any light that passes through the front also comes out the back. And so basically the blue, the blue light I'm talking about, and also green light, but to a lesser degree, these are the wavelengths from the sun that before we could see colors, before we could perceive color vision, we had a simpler, basically, visual system, which just measured time of day. That's basically it. And so that visual system that measured time of day still lives in our eyes, sort of under, so to speak, the color vision. It's still, it's subconscious. We don't consciously perceive it. The color vision is part of our conscious. It connects to our conscious brain, creating these images and so on. But the the timekeeping systems are still subconscious and they're affected by the blue, the wavelengths. Really, it's just a wavelength of electromagnetic energy. We call it light. We call it the color blue because that's what we consciously perceive. But irrespective, imagine it's just information, irrespective of the color blue and, and what we call light and colors and what we know consciously. It's a stimulus from the environment that affects our system. And, and so the thing is it's the the blue light that affects this subconscious system is the same thing we call the color blue consciously that's why we say blue light affects the system so when you block that blue light to benefit this circadian system at night what that means is that the blue light that we see as blue is also blocked because it's the same wavelengths of light that affect the subconscious system that we perceive consciously as blue. And so when you remove the blue, the lens can no longer be clear because if it was clear, that means all the blue is still passing through, all the colors are passing through unchanged. So you remove the blue, the lens turns very yellow. If you remove the green as well, the lens turns orange red. Like the ones I'm wearing right now are like a deep orange red. Mm -hmm. And these are the sleep lenses. So at night we remove the blue and the green, both because the science implies that the blue has an impact on our sleep and circadian rhythm, but green also has a lesser impact based on some studies, but more than anything, based on the, my experience and the anecdotal evidence of thousands and thousands of customers and people I tested this and worked with having a more orange red lens, you feel that you get sleepier and more tired much faster. I literally know like when I'm watching, if I watch TV at night, which I don't do very often anyway, but if I do, and I'm wearing my screen lenses, which are meant for the daytime for screens and offices and schools and so on, which are yellow, which block basically still 99% of blue light just for protection during the day, which we can also touch on. But if I'm wearing these at night and then I switch to my sleep lenses, I get much more tired, much faster. So I can just feel that. So this is good for people to know. And like you, you can, from your experience, right? Like you can feel if you're driving or you're walking or you're watching TV, like it, you take them off and it almost burns, right? Like you. Oh yeah. And I, I hear the same thing from all of my clients who use them, all of my friends who I've got to use them, my family who I've bought them for, like the, the, the TV example, like people sit down to watch TV in the evening if that's their routine. And then they switch to the glasses and they start going to bed earlier just naturally because they start to feel tired because they're not getting yeah. bombarded with that blue light. 
For sure. I've had, I had my friends in high school literally wanted to kill me because I was like the party pooper. Cause I was always tired <laughs> at like nine o'clock or eight 30. Yeah, Cause I was wearing me. my glasses. They literally wanted to take my glasses and like, they would try to like take them and rip them apart. They were kind, but you know, they might've, they might've eventually broken them. Uh, but yeah, I get a lot of, is, uh, I, I get a lot of shit for wearing them like playful <laughs> shit, like uh, X-Men glasses or like just weird looks, questions, all that kind of stuff. Like, yeah, like, but yep, teach them. That's what I learned. I'm is weirdo. Just, I changed my reality. I just started being the teacher and I obviously have the business, which helps as a reinforcement, but like people no longer question like, Oh, you're weird. I'm like, they're like, Oh, hmm, you have a company. You saw these guys. Very interesting. Tell me more. Like it's, I, I created the world I wanted to live in the thing that I would be judged for. I made it so that, yeah, judge me. I'll just explain it to you. And if you're open and you're interested, I'll share it. And it judge me, but I'm going to be healthy. Mm -hmm, Totally. (laughs) I'm doing my thing. So uh, the other thing about the, so the sleep lenses, they, they're amazing. Now, everyone really needs sleep lenses, but the screen lenses, the thing that's cool is for those who work in an office or a school or something like that, I would go to school. Some researchers I recently heard on Huberman Lab, Huberman Lab podcast, some researchers, scientists, they actually say that you don't need blue light blocking glasses during the day. And again, they have their research, they have their scientific credibility, but based on the science that I've studied and the ex- some of the experts I've looked at, you know, experts disagree and have different philosophies and my own personal experience. Basically the argument is, well, if blue light, you want to block at night, you shouldn't block it during the day because you need it to stay awake. Yes. From the sun, from a fluorescent or led yeah. tube. Like I would go to school and I would be under these bright fluorescent lights, especially when I was living abroad for a year in Eastern Europe, they couldn't even afford the covers for the light tubes. It was literally just an open fluorescent tube, cool white, not warm white, burning my eyes out of my skull. It was, it was painful. And I could not just benefit from this blue light. It hurt. And so I I had even a near clear blue light lens, which was like some, some pigmentation, not like as bad as most of the fully clear ones. It was like a semi yellow. It still wasn't enough protection. So we just went all in with our yellow lenses, the screen lenses for daytime protection from fluorescent lights. Really, they should be called fluorescent LED lenses, but it's not as cool as screen lenses. Mm -hmm. So you use these when you're in an office or a school under fluorescent led lights or looking at a screen when you're in that situation and you protect your eyes but you still the best thing go outside get in the sun get some light and for people who want the full pro like you know every one or two hours for five or ten minutes at least you know but for those who want the full protocol it's pretty simple from the light perspective go to roptics.com and purchase the light diet pdf guide that i put out because it has all of these steps if you want more information and, you know, you can bundle it with your glasses and everything right now. I don't know when this is going to come out, but until uh, the end of November, we're going to have, we have a light Friday instead of black Friday sale going on. And for those who, if you miss that, don't worry, you can use even better. You can use your code. I think you should have a discount code. Yeah. And does my discount way, code work for the the course too? The course. Yes, it'll all okay. work. So, and it, take, people should go through your link anyway. So you'll have the link probably in the show notes, mm-hmm. um, you know, so that's all registered and everything, but basically th- that's really important stuff that people should know. And any other big tidbits of value w- with a second here is just, well, I just want to say I- I've heard the the podcast that you're referring to uh, by Dr. Andrew Huberman, which is a fantastic, he has a fantastic podcast, by the way, absolutely like, amazing. Uh, but yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And what he was referring to was the blue light from the sun. Like you should absolutely not wear these outside during the day. Correct. Thank but you when for you're clarifying that under these fluorescent lights, like it's, it is blinding, especially if you work in an office building and you're staring at a computer screen. Like I have a client who uh, he works in sales. And so he's staring at a computer all day under fluorescent lights. And I told him as part of his protocol, incorporate like Pomodoro breaks. And then during your breaks, go walk outside, get some natural sunlight and come back in where your screen lens is and his energy has been through the roof. Like it's just been a game changer. Yeah, of course. It's exactly, this is exactly how it works. And I have a friend too, who's in sales and he's literally on the computer, like sometimes 14, 15, 16 hour days. And he's like, dude, like it was miserable before having these glasses. And sometimes people tell me the testimonials, like they couldn't sleep for 10 years. And then they slept through the, like they couldn't sleep through the whole night for 10 years. And then they would literally sleep through the night. The first time they wore the glasses. And I'm like, are you sure? Like, you sure it wasn't just something like, are you, you know, I I even sometimes, can you imagine like, I'm like, really? 
I like these, this product did that. I did that somehow. It's, it's like almost too much, but the science is solid. I mean, you block blue light, you allow melatonin to flow naturally, especially if you're getting the sun during the day and it's a huge difference. But so people just watch the sunrise, get morning sunlight for 10 or 15 minutes and then block blue light at night. And if you can get more sun throughout the day, even better, it'll change your life. Use only candles in your house at night. Just start there. It will transform your life and don't eat big meals too late at night. If you can like eat more of your food in the morning. If you can, that's a huge, huge thing. Mm -hmm. Like eat majority of your food in the morning. Listen to other podcasts I've done majority of your food in the morning, midday hours and anything in the afternoon and the evening, make it super light. Like, so you go to sleep empty. I haven't eaten anything since I had my, actually today I only had one meal. Usually I have two to three meals, but like today I only had one meal because I ate bigger food later yesterday. So I fasted over breakfast. I ate lunch and now it's late here. So I'm not going to eat. So I ate one meal around 12, 1130. And I feel great. And I'm just going to go to sleep. I'm going to wake up super early, clean, probably around th- like 3 or 4 a.m. Yep. Because when you're empty, you don't need as much sleep. So you can sleep better and deeper. So anyhow, uh, this is like, so people can go to Ra, R-A, named after the Egyptian sun god, raoptics.com to get all of this information. And you should have probably a link in the show notes yep. as well. Talk so, a little bit about the the light diet course. I, explain the yeah, what's in that real quick. So yeah, absolutely. Um, the course is basically a simple, let's see, a simple eight steps. That was like the, to the best of my ability to condense all these ideas, eight steps, basically showing everything. There's videos that are linked. It's basically in the form of a PDF guide, but the videos are all linked in there and they go out to a video platform where you can watch the videos. Um, You know, only people who purchase the course and use these links get access to the videos. And basically you can go through and, and get all this information. And to me, if I had had this years ago, it would have saved me a lot of time and research. And it, it's, I think $97. So it's really cheap for how much value we're offering. Uh, So it's great. And then over time, I'm going to publish more, share more, do more podcasts, maybe release a gen two of the course. And I don't know when this is coming out, but probably in the not so far future, we're going to be releasing raw red light therapy, which is going to be basically, yeah, really high quality red light therapy devices uh, that, you know, we stand behind. We've worked with the experts to develop and we want people to have that option to to get from us where they know they're going to get the best product and have exceptional customer service. And maybe there's, there's a million red light therapy brands, but you really don't know what you're getting. Like 90% of the time, if you go for most of the brands, except maybe some of the few most trusted. Mm -hmm. Uh, So anyway, we're going to join the ranks and and provide something really amazing. So I'm very happy about that because I use it myself and when I'm not traveling all the time. Yeah. I'm very excited for that myself. Um, Definitely going to, have to get yeah, one we'll of those. Great, we'll give you a great deal. So yeah, and and you guys can get a great deal too. Like like you was mentioned, there's going to be a link in the show notes, um, and just follow that, and you can get a discount. I believe it's ten percent off of the glasses, and then as uh, off of the course as well. Which for ninety seven dollars, like he's basically going to give you a blueprint for how to optimize your health. <laughs> Again, no brainer decision. Like, thank you so much, brother. I really I, appreciate it. Yeah. I, I recorded a podcast a while ago talking about when people think something is expensive, that just means they don't see the value in it. So instead of thinking about the monetary cost of it, think about the cost of not investing in that thing. Like what is, what is not optimizing your health, happiness, and productivity? What is that going to cost you? Yeah. Right? You know, that's a perfect, actually really great thing. I agree with you hundred percent. It's a really great thing to so leave people to kind of stew on energetically to wrap this up. I recently saw like a tweet of a meme that was very, very telling. It's, and it was with this perspective, it was a much deeper analysis than people just look at it and glance over. It said something like people don't like super rich people don't buy really expensive, expensive things in spite of the price. They buy it for the price. Mm. Now there's many ways to look at that, but not, I'm not talking about people who are like, you know, just being wasteful or something like it. There's people who actually work hard. I'm, I want to focus on these people who work super hard and actually create a lot of value in the world. And they want to have something that feels like it, it is worth their money. The pe- people who buy the newest, nicest iPhone, because they work, they work so, so hard. They deserve that. You know, they're constantly overcoming themselves. They want the thing that's nice for them. It's like saying, I, 
I deserve this. You know, it's a completely different universe than where many people inhabit. And that's kind of a, just an example of, of the shift in perspective that seems so impossible that we have to be able to overcome, to overcome our past selves, whatever our limitations are. It doesn't mean we need to spend exorbitant amounts of money. It doesn't mean that that's a frugal way to live or the way a master might live, but it's just an example of a completely different way of thinking about the same thing. One person scarcity, one person like, how much could I spend? You know, cause I, there's city cause versus I abundance. It. Yeah. Yeah. So you should cool. always be abundant in your spending with, uh, with personal development. Totally. It's but, uh, like worthy. Yeah, Matt, thank you so much for the longest podcast that I've ever recorded. I oh, think so great. This one's going to be a lot different than what I'm used to putting out, but I think it's good. And I think people need to not just hear it, like I said, but actually listen to what to what you were saying. Um, so, yeah, thank you thank for you, coming man. on. If you guys want to support his mission and everything that he's doing, again, there's going to be a link in the show notes of this podcast to get a discount on all raw optics products. Um, so yeah, with that, Matt, any, any last words of wisdom, you know, go to raw using the link you have, and then that'll get the discount for people. Um, if, especially if black Friday sells over, cause the link applies the discount. Secondly, people can follow me on Instagram at the light diet and just, your podcast Do the best too. you can to shine on and just choose love in every situation. It's so difficult, but the difficult path seems to be the right one almost always because it's, it means we're overcoming ourselves. So and thank you so much, brother. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Last thing, shout out your podcast. Oh, my podcast is the light diet podcast. And I do a lot of solo casts right now called quantum field reports, just me talking and sharing things I'm thinking about. And maybe when, you know, here and there, when I've am on my travels, I come across someone interesting who I want to interview in person because I try to do in person primarily. Maybe I'll visit you sometime. We can do an interview. Uh, I may record those and publish those as well. So the light diet podcast on iTunes and every major platform. Thank awesome. you so much, brother. Thanks again, Matt.